All right, so as usual, we just have to wait for the everybody to get woven into the, the Zoom webinar. It just takes a moment. <clears throat> the numbers sort of go up and up, and I wait to see it level off, and then we can officially get going. Thanks, uh, Cassie, for sharing that. <clears throat> just give it a second more. Welcome, folks, as you're joining. We're just making sure everybody gets woven into the meeting. We'll get going once we have... <clears throat> Once we get everybody in, <clears throat> looks like we're almost there. Let's just give it 10 more seconds and we'll get going. Okay, great. So let's get going. Welcome everybody. Um, happy October. Uh, my name is David Plum and I'm helping to facilitate this meeting of the Maine Climate Council. Um, as always, these are public meetings. We're very excited to have many members of the public and other observers joining us today, along with members of the Climate Council and key staff. Um, I'm not going to say much more, except we welcome uh, folks uh, who are observing us that would like to comment on some of the things you're hearing today. There is, on the Maine Climate Council website, a really good platform for submitting comments uh, so we welcome you to go ahead and do that um, as we move forward today. Uh, I'll turn it over to your co-chairs um, right now to get us going. And so I'll ask uh, Director Hannah Pingree and Commissioner Melanie Lozum to, uh, to, to kick us off today. Please go ahead. Great. Um, well, thank you, David. And uh, again, it's great to see you all here, and I, I would say that I'm not going to give a, a long intro, but just say that uh, today really represents the beginning of starting to really sort out where people are. And I want to really just first thank um, Climate Council members who weighed in on the survey. I know that was a lot to get through, but people, um, many of you took the survey. If you didn't, it, it's not too late. We still are, the comments are helpful. I, I want to especially say that many of you wrote incredibly thoughtful and specific comments. And I think some of the discussion today will reflect the comments that you made. And some of them are comments that we will follow up on. I think there's some really important and detailed thoughts that each of you have coming from, you know, your specific experiences, your constituencies you represent. And so we really look forward to digging into those. Um, David's going to do a, a g overview of the agenda, but I think it's today is really about diving into detailed discussions of those items where where people really want to talk. They want to express their opinion. They have concerns. They don't fully understand. So we're going to focus today on getting into those details, which can be a little messy. And so I really just ask people to be honest. Um, to uh, listen to each other and um, to continue the conversation after um, this meeting because I will say that we are not going to finish anything likely in this three hour call and the course of the next couple months is really working together to come to agreements on really big and hard issues that um, we need to recommend to the state. So again, thank you all for for diving in. I know that the again the survey was long by the very end on some of the adaptation and resilience things. People were running out of gas and, and it's really um, a lot to absorb and there's certainly need for clarity on some of the items. So again, thank you. Um, Sarah is gonna do a little presentation a little bit later this morning to start to dive into what does our, what is the Climate Council's role in, in she's gonna present a hypothetical on transportation. Um, and I think we've all, even as, as, as staff and leaders of this process, tried to think about what is the Climate Council's role as it relates to making these things happen. And our staff is working pretty actively with commissioners across state government, many who are on this call, on specific implementation plans. Like how are we gonna accomplish the things that have been proposed, especially in now a budget environment that is much more difficult. Um, so, and I think that's a, a role and a discussion that we're going to wrestle with in the next couple of meetings. Um, but I think what we're starting to really think about is, is making sure you as council members have a sense of, of 
what agency, what partners are going to make these things happen, and that we need to pick metrics um, or outcomes that we as a council want to see happen. By the end of the four-year climate action plan 2025, uh, metrics for 2030, and sort of, you know, big picture thoughts for 2050. So I think, you know, we'll again go back and forth about what is the council's specific, what do we want to see in this plan, but I, I think that focusing on outcomes and then, you know, we're kind of the governing body that doesn't go away and you continue to, you will, we will all be sort of forces to continue to advocate for, advocate for how are we doing on getting to what we said we wanted to accomplish by 2025, pushing that, whether it's, you know, through the le state legislature and the budget process, through, you know, you know, public adoption of some of the things that we'll talk about. So again, I'm not sort of saying this is how it's going to be, but I think we're all wrestling with like intricate details of program design. They're not all gonna be done by December 1, but where do we wanna be and what does the state need to accomplish in the next four years? I think that is really our role. Um, so I, that's really the, the major thing I wanna say. I want, the only other thing is, is I just really wanna thank, um, the folks who were able to attend uh, the equity webinar, the science and technical report webinar, um, the synapse and ERG um, consulting modeling discussion. I think those were all really helpful and additive. If you didn't have time to attend that, I totally get it. This is getting to be a lot. Um, I would say that those are recorded and online if you have a couple hours and want to check them out. And again, those reports, especially um, the beginning um, overviews, executive summaries of those are, I think, incredibly helpful. So if you haven't had time to read them, I would still say it's never too late. Encourage you to do that. Um, so I, I think um, I think I'll pass it off to Melanie, who might talk a little bit about sort of the realities that the state is also grappling with at this point. But I just want you all to know that as we sort of grapple with the state budget crisis and you know lots of insane realities of the world. Um, we are committed, and I think everyone in this council is committed to a bold action plan that we can implement and that will, you know, I think that we can all feel proud of. So how we get there in the next month and a half is gonna be a work in progress, you know, and we do not have every answer for you today. And we may not have every answer by December 1, but I really appreciate um, all of you who are pushing, I think from all sides, pushing go further faster or, Please be careful. I'm worried about this constituency. And, and those are the things that we're each going to be balancing. So um, again, I will pass it off to my co-chair, Melanie. And again, um, thanks everyone for, for, for your digging in that I know you will all do today. Thanks, Anna. Um, I, I think you covered everything I had on my list of things to cover. Um, but I do also want to thank everybody here and recognize that um, I think we're at a time when people's schedules are getting really busy and uh, we can't thank you all enough for the time that you're committing to this process. Um, like Hannah said, there's a lot of material to digest and it's, you know, incredible substance that we're all really fortunate to be able to be engaged together on. Um, so appreciate the time that you spend here today. Um, I think that, as Hannah said, you know, this is the time when we're going to start to have some of those hard conversations and we're not going to be able to figure everything out. We're not going to have absolute consensus on everything. Um, but as a manager in state government, please don't underestimate the value of even where there isn't consensus, the expression of those opinions in writing and how that comes together in a plan that state agencies and the legislature use to identify what are priorities for the state. Um, as Hannah said, I think we're at a time when we are particularly challenged, unfortunately. Not only are we facing the impacts of climate change, but we're trying to make decisions about how to take real action at a time when state agencies are trying to curtail our budgets by 10% if state revenues don't increase. Um, so we have a lot of things that we're trying to juggle as we think about how to implement these strategies. Um, some of that work is already ongoing and planned for, and it's wonderful to see the support from this group to continue and expand that work. Um, and as Hannah said, we're definitely committed to finding ways to 
implement these recommendations. Some of them we may be able to do now, and some we need to recognize are really important but can't be accomplished immediately, but that doesn't mean that they're not worth recommending and pursuing. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the conversations today, and again, really appreciate um, all the contributions you're making to this process. Thanks, Melanie, and thanks, Hannah. That's wonderful. Um, Cassie, if you could show uh, the agenda slide, I'll walk through that real quick. Um, so you get a sense of what's going to happen. Um, today we're going to start out just we're going to do a quick pause before we really get going and um, name if there are any aha moments, any big takeaways you had over the last few weeks for those of you who listened to some of those webinars who dug into the reading. Like, what are you really taking away right so just a, a brief pause on that, then we're going to. Uh, share, uh, Sarah is going to share sort of this outlook of what Hannah says. What are we really trying to produce here? What's really valuable for the Climate Council to come up with? And that's a way of walking into the survey results and saying, what do we want to spend our time on right now? And we'll do that. And then we have two blocks of time to dig into some of these issues that you marked as let's invest scarce meeting time uh, on these issues, either because I have real concerns about it, or it can be much, much better than it's written right now. So we have two blocks and then we'll finish up. One of the things we'll put it just at the end is we'll name some of the things we're hearing of big gaps that we've heard in the last couple of weeks answer the survey. It's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but it's just some of the things that have been most repeated. So, you know, we're hearing, we're hearing you and we're figuring out how to put it in, um, in this draft package. Okay, so that's our agenda. I had also promised you uh, at the beginning of this meeting, we would do a quick confirmation of how you as a group will be making decisions in reaching a final um, sort of conclusion uh, report. Uh, so if we could just quickly go to the next slide. <clears throat> how are we gonna make decisions? I propose three big ideas here uh, that have worked in other uh, similar types of councils or committees. And the first thing is, we're going to do everything we can to do what Melanie says, right? Can this group reach some consensus ideas uh, where we can all live with what's in this report, right? We're speaking with one voice. Now, consensus in my book means we can all live with the package, right? We may not be thrilled about every piece in there. We like some things to be different, but as a package, we can live with it. We're okay having our name at the bottom saying, yep, we were a council member. We're okay. That's consensus in my book. And we'll use some very explicit tools like a survey or other things to make sure we're there as we get closer to the end. Okay, now the next thing in this, Cassie, if you could advance the slide, um, we're gonna have differences of opinion. We've already seen them, right? The working groups had some of them. Um, and so we need to strive to problem solve around those. And we don't have a ton of time, right? So the way you problem solve and the way you try to work your way through these differences of opinion is about helping each other understand what's really important, right? Because if we're, we're, if we're fighting about a position, right, we're in conflict on a position, the pathway out of that is understanding what's really underlying those concerns and then we can creative prob creatively problem solve on that. We don't have a ton of time, right? So some issues are gonna just exceed our time and our ability as a group. Which brings me to the third point here, which is for the disagreements where we just can't live with something as written, we can, in the single report we'll produce, include some multiple viewpoints on very specific points where you all say, you know what, I just, I can't live with it as written. I need to have the report also include this other viewpoint, right? So it's one document. There's no majority report or minority report. It's one report. And on the specific points where people are feeling so deeply uncomfortable, they can't even lend their name to the report, we can include a second viewpoint, right? Some folks in the council express this viewpoint. It'll read something like that, maybe a little less colloquial than that, all right? But we know that you as a group have more power, more influence, more capacity to change what's happening if you do speak with one voice. So we wanna to try to minimize this as much as possible, right? Because each time we do this, we kind of reduce our power. But we need to do it if you all can sign this report and feel comfortable that your name's associated with it, okay? 
All right, just let me do a pause and um, and let's use the hand raise in the in the Zoom because I can't see very well when we have a screen like this. Any concerns uh, about this pathway for making decisions for you as a council? Go ahead and just raise your hands in the Zoom feature or un unmute and, and, and yell because I can't see if people are making signals at me. We all good? Okay, great, wonderful. Um, all right, so let's do this initial pause, folks. Um, let's go ahead and drop the slides for a moment and be able to see ourselves. Okay, here we are. And I welcome everybody to turn their camera on if you can. Uh, I know some of us have small kids at home or other things, it makes it challenging, so no worries. Uh, but if you can, I welcome you to turn your camera on. And for those of you who did some reading, for those of you that listened in to the webinars over the last two weeks, we wanna hear just a shout out right now of some really big takeaways that you had from this. Either something new or a reaffirmation of something that was in your head and now it's really clear in your head. Let's just do 10, 10 minutes on this real quick and see what we've got. But I wanna test the waters to see what impact these webinars, all the reading that we threw at you had. So quick shout out, what do we have folks? Any big ha ahas over the last two weeks? Representative Bloom, go ahead please. Thank you. Um, in looking at the Maine's climate goals, um, I think that with the uh, advent of this Mitchell study report that the ensure that Maine's climate strategies are equitable, I see now the importance of that and I see how it may lead us in terms of how we're going to be able to do this through our rural state. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I think that was kind of an aha moment, moment for me to learn that it really makes sense to do that first and, and how to prioritize and how to make it basically from the ground up. So I, um, I, that's one of my moments. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else have something like that? Melissa? Yeah, I would just, I would just second that in, in terms of the equity assessment, it really came to light for me that it's important that we focus on our most vulnerable communities first because they will be the ones who are most impacted by the climate crisis and they're already being impacted by a lot of other factors. Um, and so I think that, you know, we've, we've had that as a goal throughout this whole process in the working groups um, and in the, in the council, but I think that Today, as we have our conversation, prioritizing equity is really going to be an important piece. Thanks, Melissa. Anything else that jumped out at folks over the last couple of weeks? Anything you want to share? Yeah, I see Matt. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that they're going through the reports and attending the webinars is that we really have a lot of work to do on uh, transmission and delivery to really work on the electrification to prepare for electric vehicles. And that was sort of common across all the subgroups uh, is how do we, well, you know, as we move towards electrification, how do we ensure that we can deliver that uh, energy easily to everybody who needs it? And it's kind of a, to, you know, I think pretty soon this month, you're going to see the first round of electric Mustangs land here in Maine. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's here. So we just have to figure out how to tie that together. And I think that's one of the big takeaways I had is that it'd be great to be able to focus on some of that uh, for the group. Super. Thanks, Matt. Ken? Yeah, kind of a two part one, David. Um, one thing that, that came through pretty clearly is the degree to which resources are gonna be necessary to implement, uh, I, I would say any, certainly many of our recommendations. Um, and the second piece is sort of the default thinking that um, 
these are hard times and we don't have many resources, so we can't do as much as we might like to. Uh, unfortunately, however, this is climate change and it's bearing down upon us. And this is not like a choice of uh, buying a new car or not, and I can postpone that. Uh, we, the fact is we will pay. And we will either pay in recovery and suffering, or we will pay to avoid emissions. And so we have a choice of picking one. We don't have a choice of paying or not paying. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sandy? Good, uh, let's see, I'll get this thing right. Oh yeah, yeah I am on. Okay, I'm off. Good. Now. All right, thanks. Um, I wanted to just uh, call out that um, the old notion of smart growth planning makes an amazing resurgence here because it covers so many pieces. When you're thinking about <clears throat> the 10 to 15,000 acres of forest land that we stand to lose every year due to development, that's a real thing. Um, and when you think about climate migration, uh, it was featured in the New York Times Magazine a couple of weeks ago, really focused on how things are changing. If you look at what's happening to Maine's real estate market, uh, housing prices are going off the top of the charts. And <clears throat> this is a, a really important opportunity to combine all of these important, all these things, reduction of vehicle miles traveled, compact development, protection of forests, um, <clears throat> convenience, community resilience, a, a more compact community is more resilient. Uh, people get to know each other and trust each other a little bit more. Um, opportunities for public transportation, a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as a result of building with, uh, with main products. Um, so I just, I, I think that this is, uh, this is something we've been talking about for 20, 25 years, smart growth planning. It's back, it's center stage, and it's uh, a perfect opportunity to dig into that. It takes a lot of land use planning and it might take some change, but this is what we're here to do. Thanks. Thanks, Sandy. I'll go to Judy, then Anya, and then I'll circle back to, to Lydia Bloom. Judy, go ahead. Um, good morning. Um, that was music to my ears. Thank you, Sandy. Um, uh, two things. One, I was really struck in the uh, survey yesterday of the, uh, the similarity and complementarity of uh, the recommendations from the working, Natural and Working Lands Group, which I, mostly it came from there, in terms of rules and statutory updates and changes. And that was just really encouraging to see that. Um, and then the other thing that really struck me in the support letters that have been, or just comments that have been coming in, is um, the resounding significance and importance of this issue to the business community and their support for the actions that we're taking. And so that really speaks to me to this uh, there's a sense that we're pulling together here on this and it, that it goes right across the economy. So that, that was a real aha for me to, to see those, those support letters and, and the, this, the, just the breadth of interest and support from the businesses. So. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Um, Anya? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, and, and thanks everyone for your comments. I definitely agree and um, had similar aha moments to a lot of you. Um, one thing that I haven't heard talked about yet um, is within the equity analysis, um, I was really struck by um, how important their recommendations are to include within our plan in order to, to create a plan that's um, not only equitable for everyone, but also successful. And something that really um, struck it, or came out to me during that um, presentation was um, Ambassador Dana's comments on tribal sovereignty and the importance of um, working with Maine's tribes um, and the huge intersections that that has with, with our climate plan. Thanks. Thanks, Anya. Um, Daniel Cleveland was trying to get a word in and then I'll quick come back to, to Lydia. Daniel, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, a couple points. Um, one, I think we need to be very careful and be sure that we're laying out um, kind of what's technically necessary to accomplish these goals without um, starting to get into the realm of what's politically possible. Um, I think our job is to lay out a bold marker and let the policymakers 
uh, with our, I think, support and cooperation, um, deal with the politics. Um, that's one. I don't think we should be betting against ourselves or negotiating, negotiating against ourselves before we even uh, submit this plan. Uh, and the, the second related point is, um, I think by our own standards, we're already coming up short. You look at page 10 of the first part of the draft proposal, and it says that our own recommendations are not fully sufficient to accomplish the statutory requirements. So I think we should, just, I would like to highlight that to all the, the council members that we're already, um, based on our own recommendations, um, not presenting a bold enough proposal. Uh, and finally, and this goes to Ken and Matt's point, I found that in all the materials, we're kind of, it seems we're burying the leads here. Um, all of these proposals, or most of them, assume a massive investment in infrastructure uh, to electrify our lives. Uh, and that is both how we are going to ge generate the power and then how we're gonna distribute that power to households and businesses uh, via the grid and via a broadband network. And I think we should be more upfront and honest about what is required um, instead of just presenting what the end goals are, which are the proposals, we need to, I think, be upfront about the kind of investment, both public and private, that's gonna be required to accomplish these. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Lydia Bloom, please go ahead. Uh, yes, and um, the Create Jobs and Economic Opportunity Goal, uh, I just realized I haven't read Strengthening Maine's Clean Energy Economy. And, but what I, what I found is, is that I was looking more for more specifics on what kind of jobs are, and op economic opportunity are we creating with any of these strategies? Like, can we be more specific? Can we talk about you know, the opportunities that climate change, for instance, the, the Northwest Passage in the Ar Arctic being opened up, what does that do to our working waterfronts? There are some things that I think we, we missed in that sense, um, but I would like to see more specifics on what jobs and opportunity, and if you're going to tell me that strengthen it, that, that report really says it, then I'm I just need to read it, uh, um, but it may be, it may also just be good to have that woven through a little bit more of our report. I just only want to just, um, these comments are super helpful. Representative Bloom, I just want you to know, you haven't missed anything yet. The report isn't done. So there's only kind of a executive summary of what it's going to be. And that's something that you will all get a special invite to in the next couple of weeks. And exactly what you suggest, how do we weave that in once we read that is, is, is totally, um, a goal of, of ours. So that was well said. And I just want you to know you didn't miss any of your homework. We oh, great. yet. God, thank God. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let's do this. That was a great round and it really laid the groundwork for some big thoughts that we need to weave into the substance we're going to do. To get into that substance, the first thing we want to do is have Sarah Curran from Hannah Pingree's team give us a flavor of what we think the output could look like hypothetically or not so hypothetically at this point because it is october 1st um and so i'm wondering if um uh sarah if you um you could go ahead and give us this presentation about where we're headed what we can expect our output might look like thanks david and yes um I'll talk a little bit more about how we got to where we are and also where we're going to go in the next couple of months. So um, Cassie, would you please bring up the first slide? Thank you. So just a reminder that um, in June, we had six working groups who presented their recommended strategies to all of you. And those strategies were delivered in six different reports that were developed by stakeholders with expertise and experience in their specific areas. So these reports contain hundreds of pages um, that will be incredibly useful to you in the coming weeks um, and to the legislature and state agencies and others as we move into implementation. So just wanna ground us in those six reports that we received um, back in June. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Oh, Cassie, would you move to the next slide, please? You should have gotten stuck. What we can do, Sarah, if you want to just Should keep just rolling, keep one of us, yeah, okay. one of us can uh, can perhaps share. I'll try to see if share. you can share. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in September, we presented the draft strategy framework, and that was a new document. Um, and the idea with the framework was to take us from the six working groups into a single action plan for Maine. It was organized <clears throat> into two parts. The first was part one about reducing our our emissions and the second was about preparing for climate change. And so that draft framework included the strategies from the working group reports, but at a pretty summary level. And it also started to incorporate um, some of the highlights from the cost benefit analysis from the public input surveys conducted over the summer. And so that was where we were for the two meetings in September. And next slide, please. And then today, oh, and you can flip through Cassie if you were to bring them all in, thank you. Um, today we start to move from the high level of the framework and down into more of the specifics of the actions that the working groups recommended. Next slide, please. So the next step is going to be to develop an implementation plan for the actions that this council wants to include in the climate action plan for Maine. So in this example, if we take the recommended actions to reduce emissions by increasing EV use, electric vehicles, this council may want to set specific targets for the percentage of EVs in 2025 and the percentage of EVs in 2030. And these, we can look back to the modeling to see what kinds of numbers get us to the goals that we want to achieve. And to Daniel's point earlier, um, we are currently talking with Synapse about how we can change some of the, the policy levers that were in that model so that we can make sure that the actions and the specific targets that we put in the plan will get us to the goals that, that we want to hit. Um, and then thinking about the equity assessment, which several of you also mentioned this morning, this is another opportunity to build in specific metrics. So we may want to think about percentage allocation. So to say that a certain number of electric vehicle rebates will go to low, low household, low income households, for example. Um, the last thing I want to emphasize is that there's also an opportunity here when we think about implementation to look at programs that we already have and that we can build on and leverage. So in this example, we have a rebate program and a charging program, charging infrastructure program at the Efficiency Main Trust. And so thinking about how we build on and leverage that program is different than thinking about starting and funding a whole new program. And I think that helps us as we think through the challenge of implementation and kind of what, where we need to start and prioritization. And next slide, please. And so just continuing this example, again, this is just, this is how we want to play through each of the actions, right? We have the action area and that talks generally about what we want to do. We have the specific actions that talk about what we want to achieve by 2025. And then we have the implementation considerations. And again, thinking about whether or not there's an existing program that we can leverage. And in the coming weeks, as this council makes decisions about what is in the climate action plan for Maine, we can continue to refine the language in those actions and also um, to develop the specifics of the implementation. And I'll turn it back over to you, David. Great, thanks so much folks. And I'll just keep rolling here. So that's a window into what your December 1 report could look like, right? And so it's really thinking about that 2025 mark and what's been achieved by then and then the goals you want to set further out. Um, obviously, there's legislation that has set goals already, and that's what's motivating us uh, in all the work we're doing. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the survey results because this preps us up for the conversations we're going to have right now. Um, so if for members of the public who are observing this, we sent a survey out to the Climate Council's members, and basically we took all of the actions that were in the working group reports, right? And we tucked them in um, to this new structure we have. And we asked you four questions about it, right? And the first question was, should we invest our scarce meeting time in this issue, either because it needs to be much stronger, and I love it, 
or I have some serious concerns about it some other, for some other reason, right? So we wanted to test where, where you wanted to spend your meeting time. And then we had a couple other things you could answer, like, I think it's on the right track, no worries kind of thing. Uh, I think it's on the right track, but I have these comments, or honestly, I don't have a strong opinion. Okay, so we got 27 of you to respond. Thank you so much. As you know, that final strategy bucket, when you put everything from Natural Working Lands Working Group and everything from Coastal Marine Working Group and everything from the Resilience Super Group together, it was a bit of a monster. And I think Hannah's already referred to the fact that that requires some thoughtful um, combining and perhaps prioritizing. But we got 27 folks to take it. Thank you. Uh, we got a lot of good comment that we will share back to you and we were already, we're already starting to read through. Um, and we got some numerical clarity about how many people think we should spend scarce meeting time um, on a particular issue. And this is the results. Um, we had the largest number of mentions, right, of invest our scarce meeting time um, on this issue, this action, was all about the financing and funding ones. Surprise, surprise. All right, so the biggest numbers we got there, which would be like nine out of 20 something respondents, um, was the transportation funding one, which is explore sources to fund transportation. I'm using shorthand here. It's not the full text of the um, action. Investigate the potential of multi-stake or national carbon pricing. This was inside the energy recommendations and beyond the electric sector. Um, and the finance uh, one around in the electric uh, uh, working group set of actions, right? Create mechanisms or entities to finance Maine's energy system, right? And authorize initial catalyzation. So those were big ones, right? So we know that you wanna talk about those. There was another energy one that got a fair number, um, four. Again, everything else was three and below, all right? So I'm showing you anything four and above of a number of mentions. Everything else was three and above, zero, ones, twos, or up to three. There was kind of a catch-all energy action item that was focused around ensuring economic benefits are maximized in the state. It had a lot of stuff in there. I wonder if a bunch of you mentioned it because it's actually not all that clear, the focus of that. So I think we've asked Dan Burgess, he's gonna help clear, clarify what that is and we can talk about the concerns you had on that. And then there were some others, a couple of transportation ones that received some fours, the EV roadmap, right? And the potential to develop a pilot around medium heavy duty EV. Um, and potential alternate fuel vehicles, modes of transportation. And then another one, which was down in the infrastructure piece, which is about developing and uh, adopting siting materials and design standards for climate ready infrastructure writ large, right? So that's not just energy infrastructure, but all infrastructure. Okay, this was the four and above, right? This is what uh, this is what you all said you'd want to spend your time on. And what we want to do now is to, to, to jump in. And the way we're going to jump in is we're going to start over on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, today, we're going to work on the ones, uh, these two up here with the transportation. I don't know if you see my mouse making movements there. Uh, we're going to start here. We're going to get into here in our first block of time, hopefully. So if, with any luck, we'll do these three in our first block of time. And then for our biggest block of time, we're going to spend some time today talking about finance and funding. Okay, so that's the plan. And I think um, I'm the one sharing. So let me stop sharing. Give me one sec and I'll get my screen sorted out. <clears throat> Okay, um, so this is why we're gonna do it. We, um, if I could ask someone to throw into the chat the two transportation ones that are just about the EV roadmap and the pilot, um, what we're gonna be doing is putting in the chat the full text of those actions that you had clicked on. I wanna have a conversation about it. We're gonna ask for some clarity from the folks at the state, typically who are working most on these issues. And then we're gonna talk about why you were concerned about it and what we could do about it. And then we're gonna take a pause and see where we stand after we give it a certain amount of time. 
Okay, so let's talk about these two that Sophia just put in to the chat. And I think, um, Sophia, if you could actually rechat those to everybody, including attendees, so the public can see what we're looking at as well, that would be helpful. So observers can see the text of what we're talking about. To get going here, I'm going to ask um, Taylor uh, from Hannah's team, it was also with DOT, um, to kick us off a little bit to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the develop a statewide EV roadmap idea to give a little bit more flavor about it and also about the pilots. And Taylor, if you need to tap into somebody else, whether it's Dan Burgess at the Energy Office or someone else, just let me know. But if you could give us the sort of two minute version uh, about what's going on, and then I'm gonna ask the commissioner as well, Bruce Van Note, to say a word about putting an equity analysis on an EV uh, strategy for the state. We'll do that for about five minutes, and then we'll have a discussion about what was concerning for all of you uh, that merited this as a discussion point. So Taylor, let me turn it over to you to just give us a little bit more flavor about what's going on behind that action, the work in the working group and what the state's doing and thinking about this. Oh, you're on mute still, Taylor, sorry. Can't hear me? Now oh. we can, okay. we got you. Um, so the EV roadmap came out of the transportation working group and a similar product has actually already been produced for a handful of other states. The roadmap will essentially be a comprehensive strategy to accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles across the state using policies, uh, purchasing incentives, which would include those for low-income households, um, expansion of charging infrastructure, and we'll address issues such as the electric grid and utility rates. Um, additionally, we were going to discuss the uh, pilot study. So uh, we've watched, we've all watched the options for electric light duty vehicles evolve um, over the recent years, but the path is less clear when it comes to reducing emissions from medium and heavy duty vehicles. So there isn't currently a solution to reduce emissions from medium and heavy duty vehicles uh, that could easily fit into our EV roadmap. So this piloting program would help identify um, what that solution could be. And the strategy was proposed to encourage pilot adoption that would increase electrification, alternative fuels, um, and alternative modes of transportation specifically for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, that it would include school buses, public transportation, uh, ferries, and commercial vehicles. Um, if I missed anything, Dan, feel free to chime in. And also, no, also Taylor, I mean, I, go ahead, Dan, sorry. I, I don't think you missed anything, Taylor. I think that was a good overview. Um, you know, I think there are a number of different states or energy offices that have uh, completed EV roadmaps in the recent years, some, some within the last couple of years, some going back, you know, more six to eight years, but kind of the, the constant that you see, this is in, you know, examples would be Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Colorado, they're looking at kind of the full landscape of, of uh, policies, education, incentives, um, things that are needed to, to advance electric vehicles in their states. And we've done a little bit of work already to look at, you know, what um, what would such a roadmap look like here in Maine? And I think it's a, um, you know, really exciting opportunity to, to begin to take that comprehensive view from not just kind of where the chargers need to be or how many do we need, but you know, what's really needed to have the market advance and to make, make sure that we're looking at kind of um, affordability and, and, and equity issues. And, um, you know, other states have had um, stakeholder processes to engage that, have brought consultants on board um, to help with some of the more technical issues. Um, so overall, I think, you know, there's, there's uh, good potential here. And I think the last thing I, I would say is, um, 
you know, the, the states are, are kind of doing these, they're doing them and then updating them every couple of years. So these aren't necessarily stagnant plans. They're kind of ones that are continuously updated, especially as technologies change in um, the uh, market and uh, continues to grow, which we're seeing happen pretty rapidly. And so I think it's a good opportunity to take stock of where we are, see where we need to go, and to continue to engage um, on the electric vehicle um, future. Thanks, Dan. That's great. I also forgot to, that uh, Joyce Taylor is taking a moment out of her vacation week to be with us. And Joyce is the super expert and co-chair of, uh, of the transportation group. So thanks, Joyce, for being here. And please just chime in um, if you want to add uh, some additional detail or flavor. Um, OK, so, thank you. Excellent. Um, Bruce, then no, um, I understand you have some thoughts to share about equity in EVs and transportation. And this is a great time to share those thoughts. And I think someone was gonna give, uh, share a screen as well while you did that, is that correct, Commissioner? Yeah, I was hoping Taylor could do that. Excellent, okay. He's ready. Go ahead. Yeah, um, first of all, by way of just kind of um, setting the stage, these, these are just, uh, Thoughts that have been uh, discussed, uh, Emily, you know, Joyce is in the adjoining office. So <laughs> obviously we talk a lot, you know, uh, ab about these things. And um, and I was kind of struck by Dan's comments earlier uh, about, you know, that we shouldn't be negotiating against ourselves and we should be bold and let policymakers figure it out. And uh, just by way of introduction, um, that's kind of where I live. I'm an engineer by original training and that job when you get in its simple essence is to help turn vision into reality. Um, and I spend a lot of time up the state house with uh, representatives all across the state. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm kind of hampered, uh, if you will, uh, by thinking, how do we do this? implementation. And yes, I, I'm very struck by where's the money and all that kind of stuff. But also I was struck all the way down to the individual level. What we have to do, transportation is obviously more than half the issue we're trying to address. And the personal vehicle is the, the biggest hunk of that by far. So if you're just kind of following the math, you have to look at that. There's no question that EVs, I mean, the roadmap, that's the long-term solution. That's, where, that's definitely where we're headed. But what do we do in the next zero to four years? EVs are currently a fraction of a percent of the cars in Maine. Um, there's gonna be a transition, um, availability and acceptance. Um, you know, range is gonna be an issue, especially, and once you get away from the coast, uh, I think we have to be pragmatic that a lot of people are, are still just this may not be the first thing on their list. Uh, right now, especially right now, they're thinking about more kitchen table things. So I was looking for a way that we could be speaking to a broader audience, get the idea of fuel efficiency and how your car goes uh, to be in the forefront of people's minds and have it be so it, programs aren't just for those who could afford a new EV. So that was the backdrop and with that, um, next slide, Taylor, and I'll zip through these quick because I'm sure we have a, uh, a time crunch. Um, this was something that came from uh, Professor Rubin at UMaine, something to always keep in mind. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions, fuel efficiency and fuel uh, use are not linear. In other words, if getting something off the road that's getting 10 miles a gallon or 15 miles a gallon will actually have a shorter term uh, benefit than uh, at the very, very high end. So, and just doing, this is all just simple math, you're driving, uh, driving a thousand miles. If you got something off the road that, God forbid, is getting 10 miles a gallon, which I guess there's still some out there, and it was 15, that's a 50% increase in fuel efficiency. It saves 33 gallons for that thousand miles. If you go 15 to 20 miles a gallon, that's a third gain or 14 gallons. And if if you go from 30 miles a gallon to 35, that's 17% and it saves five gallons. And obviously the greenhouse gas emissions uh, track right with the gallonage. So 
the idea of just focusing on the high end um, isn't doesn't work with the math and it also um, if it's all new, new vehicles as we'll see it, it doesn't work for, for a lot of mainers next slide is getting at that kind of point that um, just who, who can afford any new vehicle you know um, and we're all aware of this and what the household income is. And on the left is the lowest in Piscataquis County and the highest is Cumberland. And um, what that basically says is um, affordability is a real issue uh, for everybody, for any new vehicle, including EVs. Next slide, Taylor. Um, if you take what a new vehicle monthly payment is, uh, as defined there, there's only three main counties that can make it and so use vehicles obviously the payment is is much lower and that's where uh, a court because of this that's where most people go if you go to the next slide um, the app two and three car sales are used and so um, and the average used car is somewhere around ninety three hundred dollars we got to fact check that we did some math and we checked with some other stuff but that's that's what's indicated by what we collect in in sales tax so most people are driving you uh, buying and driving used cars and uh, they're much lower cost uh, next slide and because of that they're keeping them a long time the average age of a car in Maine is nine years and so that's kind of like when uh, Daniel saying we're negotiating against ourselves I mean that's who I see ourselves as all of those obviously and so what speaks to them in terms of getting their consciousness into um, fuel efficiency and so the next slide these are these are just whether their conclusion or the kind of observations just based on uh you know that math that we just put there that replacing gas guzzlers with cars that get uh, better efficiency uh it does more uh, for greenhouse gas emissions and replacing, you know, highly fit. If you're already in something that's getting over 40, that really does, you get real bang for the buck there. Um, and new cars, including battery electric, are unaffordable for most Mainers right now. Two and three used cars are sold and the average price is under 10,000. As I just said, the fleet turnover is slow. So that led me to a conclusion, which I, I know it may not be widely shared and that's okay. Um, that's my purpose is just to throw it out there that uh, if we focus incentive programs on EVs alone, uh, we will be leaving a lot of Mainers behind. Uh, they, they're just, they don't find new cars and until we get the used EV market um, more established here, which I've been talking with Dan and others, you know, maybe we're talking about the next five years. This is really the, and that's what the action plan is looking at. Um, we may need to think about broadening the focus of the incentive programs. Next slide. And again, this is driven by pragmatism and implementation, uh, guilty, um, and a near-term jump start. Uh, while we wait for greater availability and acceptance, um, again, that few years period, I think we need to be looking at used EVs and hybrids. Hybrids were I think specifically said no hybrids are not what we're looking for. We're looking for EVs. I know there are tons of different kinds of hybrids and that's a, that's a whole discussion. But if, if we had people that were driving something that's getting under 20 and they change to a hybrid that's getting 30, that, that's a big greenhouse gas uh, benefit uh, in the near term. Um, so I think obviously these, I think we've been talking devil's always in the details, but income based uh, incentives that would generally get more moderate um, home, home buyers, car buyers. Um, at the lower end, they still may not be in that given what the age of vehicles and the cost of vehicles are. And so uh, I expect this would be controversial, but you know, do you provide some kind of income based that addresses people that gets them uh, into more fuel efficient vehicles, which in could include internal combustion engines with significantly better fuel efficiency. Um, I get that's not where we're going and that we're talking just near term. I'm, I'm just afraid if we rolled out a system 
that did not have that, that we're not speaking to geographically most of Maine, and we're not speaking to people who can't afford, uh, you know, late model and, and uh, new cars. So that's just an idea. And uh, they would reach those who can't or just don't buy new cars. And I think we have to be, um, I think we're, everybody who's going through this process has to be convinced, you know, of the vision of where we're going, but we're a relatively small group. And just in my travels in every corner of Maine, which has been a real privilege from this job, I've, I just know that there are people that this is not the first thing uh, on their uh, to-do list. And if you had a program that just gets them thinking about fuel efficiency, um, you're going to broaden that and it's going to say, this, this speaks to me. Uh, obviously, if you do that, how much money do you have? And I agree with everyone that talking about money is a very high priority, but where it comes from. And there's a lot of administrative details to work out to make sure you don't get people gaming it by selling cars to their brother and that kind of stuff. Um, but there are lessons from other states, including Vermont and others that just start recently started a program. So those were just uh, some observations and uh, options moving forward. I would expect they would engender some communication and some, some, some thoughts, but that was really the intent of doing it. And I thought this was the time to do it. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Bruce. That's wonderful. So again, trying to put an equity lens on the, the climate imperative and what that really means for this state. Okay. So we put some ideas on the table through what Taylor and Dan and Commissioner, Commissioner Bruce Van Note just said. We also know that you had reasons for clicking that button in the survey of let's invest some more time. So for those of you that did click that button, I'm very interested, and I think we're all interested to hear what was motivating you, like what's really going on there? And based on what you're hearing now, how does that, how, are, how is your thinking shaped? So if you were one of the folks who were like, I really wanna talk about this, why? I open up the floor. I also know that Kate Dempsey has something to say about the pilot, so feel free Kate to jump in at any time with that. But I, I also want to give a chance for folks who said, I want more time to talk about this to say why and how we can solve the, these. Again, we're talking about the EV roadmap and the, the pilots on uh, heavy, uh, medium, heavy duty. So who, who really wanted to, to weigh in on these issues? Uh, I see Andrew Pershing's hand up, yeah. Lori also raised her hand too. Oh, great. So uh, why don't go right ahead, both of you. Uh, go ahead, Andrew, and then I'll go. Okay, um, thanks. I, I, I really appreciated Bruce's thoughtful analysis. And I think that point about, about just, you know, doing things to step up the fuel efficiency of the, you know, of the, of the total fleet in the state, I think is really valuable. We need to be careful about anything that would incentivize the purchase of new internal combustion engines, because that's infrastructure that we are in the state stuck with for you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And I think the goal is to try to get that stock out and to move more, you know, more efficient, move the electrics in as quickly as possible. So I, I mean, I, and I, the other thing I really liked was the discussion about, uh, about used electric vehicles and making sure that we have uh, rebates for that. I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, that I think would really help accelerate getting that, uh, you know, more equitably, uh, that technology more equitably distributed throughout the state. Um, and, then, uh, and then I think the other, the other point is there's a, there's a connection here with the proposals in the built, uh, in the built environment, the, the infrastructure side, in that in order to have part of the EV roadmap has to be charged, we have to think about the charge, how to in, include charging infrastructure in, uh, in the housing stock that we're, that we're building, including uh, you know, the low income uh, housing that we're gonna be, uh, uh, you know, that the state is working on. Great, thanks. Lori. Uh, so I just wanted to say I mean, um, that I really appreciate the commissioner's presentation because uh, the, those are some of the issues that um, I've raised over time 
um, because of the challenges facing low income Mainers and the challenges that we do have in our rural areas. Um, and so I really appreciated seeing the analysis and I did, um, I do like to see that um, the idea that we can look at used and new as well. And I just also wanted to mention that, um, you know, and Andrew started talking about the grid side of things, that it's not just the, the necessary, necessarily the cost of the vehicle, but who pays for uh, the infrastructure. And if low income people then also see those increases in their um, monthly utility rates, that's where we start to have, I think, challenges and where it becomes more difficult um, to, to sell as well. And so, um, you know, I think there may be some um, opportunities um, kind of parallel to this pro to the process of putting some of these important pro programs in place to look at how we make how, how we make sure that we shore up low income programs to really protect those people um, who cannot afford um, increases. Uh, and I, I look forward, I hope, I don't want to get into housing yet since we're on, um, but um, I, um, I definitely hope we can talk a little bit about the housing piece too and, and the infrastructure in terms of how we development, uh, how we um, balance development costs um, um, as we're trying to build out affordable housing and doing it in a way that is also energy efficient. Great. Thanks, Lori. Um, I see a hand. Kate, go ahead, please. Thanks, David. And excuse if there's banging. It's not a child. It's someone working on my house. Um, I'll not repeat what Andrew or um, Lori said, but I think there are some really important points in there. We, uh, but I will emphasize the point that Andrew was making about a well-designed um, trade-in program. There's all sorts of names for it. Is really a must, and that has to be pretty visionary. We can link that to where we get that revenue in, a in another part of this conversation, I think. Um, but I just wanted to speak to the how the working group really did highlight this roadmap concept with this integration of EV infrastructure. And um, I've been really proud of us in this state when uh, the NGO, the private business sector and state government can work together on really innovative pilot programs. We've done it in almost every sector, whether it's solar, whether it's road infrastructure and stream crossings uh, with fishing gear uh, in partnership with fishermen. Um, so I think we have a real opportunity right now to harness some kind of visionary approach that shows um, a path forward for this kind of work. And I think it is gonna take all of us to get pilots off the ground, but I think we have the capacity in the state to do it. And what that does is it really transforms how people think about the opportunity. You really have to show what's possible and then people in communities can get, get excited. But by just telling people it's gonna work, there's, you know, the commissioner brought up real skepticism and real concerns, but I think we have an opportunity through pilot projects um, in some of the places that the commissioner noted, some of the counties the commissioner noted could be really, really exciting. That's great. Pat and then Ken. Yes, I, I just wanted to chime in. I thought that Commissioner Van Oates presentation is uh, right on the mark. Um, I live in a rural area. My industry is based in rural Maine. You've heard me say I own a Prius and an F-150, so on average I'm doing the best I can given the uh, places I need to travel. Um, but I think to make this relevant, we've got to model in some of those real life uh, situations into this plan. And um, I think we've got to be able to appeal to the folks um, in rural Maine, and it's that kind of thinking that I think is going to make this plan um, uh, important and relevant. And at the same time, we don't want to lose our visionary uh, quest, but I, I think there's a, a, a rural economy that um, has other priorities right now, and we've got to work with them and have a plan that reaches all Mainers. So I just a uh, uh, vote of confidence in some of the perspectives that the commissioner presented. Thanks, Pat. Ken? 
Thank you, David. Um, I was supportive of this uh, option, uh, largely for the reasons Andrew mentioned, but even more importantly, I think it's uh, as close to a silver bullet as we have from an equity standpoint. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that uh, low and moderate income folks need uh, inexpensive, low cost, reliable transportation. And I trust you all are aware of the massive maintenance and reliability benefits of EVs. What many people don't realize, and which is why it's so important to get EVs on the road so that we get an EV used, a used EV market, is that these are technologies. Uh, everybody is anxious to run out and get a new laptop, and they're pretty expensive, a thousand or two thousand dollars. Has anybody tried to sell their used laptop mm. or their used iPhone? You're lucky if you get 250 bucks. That's what's going to happen with EVs. And that's why they are so attractive. I already know people who have gotten uh, EVs, used EVs, with mileage in the hundreds of miles, not even thousands of miles, for under $10,000. So if we get to the used EV market, or let me just say, what can we do to get to the used EV market? Because that will be, as I said, as good a silver bullet for low and moderate income folks as exists, let alone for the climate. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Sandy, and then Judy. Thanks. I really appreciate uh, Bruce's comments and, and Pat's comments about the nature of uh, the rural state of Maine and the distances traveled and the need for heavier duty and medium duty uh, trucks and cars and so forth. Um, it's a good reality check based in the equity uh, sphere. Um, I just, I, just to be clear, we're also talking about at the same time developing EV infrastructure, right? So that during this bridge period, we want to be aware of and incentivize the used uh, medium and heavy duty uh, markets. Uh, but we also need to continue to assure that we're going to be building up an infrastructure so that when we do get to used EVs and EVs do start showing up more and more on our roads that uh, we've got the infrastructure to enable that to happen and and then encourage more people to, to move to that form of transportation. Just checking in on that one. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And I'll just mention that I think that is the very intent of the EV roadmap is how do you strategically and effectively accelerate that um, charging infrastructure. Uh, Judy East. So again, echoing a really um, very glad to hear uh, Commissioner Van Note's presentation. I wanted to switch the subject quickly with a question about compressed natural gas uh, for what I think is medium duty. I'm literally staring at my husband's one ton refrigerated truck that he bought used out of Texas. It's set up with compressed natural gas. And I recall back when gas was four or $5 a gallon, that was seen as the bridge fuel for large trucks because it had the, I don't know, the power to, to move those big things. So my question is, is there an infrastructure in Maine? Because he doesn't use it at all. Is, is it because there's one in Texas, but there isn't one here? Is that any part of our thinking for the medium and heavy duty truck infrastructure that bridges us to, um, I don't know if you'll ever get to an electric truck. I, I just don't know the technology. So I just pose that as a question to you guys that know more about this than I do. Because I, at one point, it seemed like it, this was the bridge to, to a future that was more efficient for now, at least. And I wonder and this greenhouse gas. Judy, Judy, that's helpful. I wonder if, if Joyce is still out there to talk at all about what the group discussed in some of that realm. Yes. Um, to be honest, you know, I think we really didn't chase other fuels other than biodiesel and electric. And I think it was mostly, frankly, out of um, time. We just didn't have the time to chase it. It did come up a couple times that it felt like we were picking a winner when there were some other things on the table. Um, that said, you know, 
We also knew California is setting some really high standards. They're gonna drive that market and they're gonna drive, I think the innovation in terms of the, the larger vehicles. Um, so, you know, I think it will come just because California is gonna make it come. Um, and Judy, there is a truck. Yes, there is a truck um, electric that's coming. So um, I think, um, I, but we just didn't chase the, you know, any other things really other than electric biodiesel. And I, and I would just say that um, I think that um, Dan maybe spoke to this a little bit. I mean, the, I think the idea of the EV roadmap is seeing what's possible in the near term and the pilots are sort of like, <clears throat> how do you really test out different ideas? I think we're going to see transition in the market in the next four years, especially on medium and heavy duty vehicles. We're definitely seeing that in other parts of the world. I was just on a panel with somebody talking about city in China where, you know, 50% of all medium duty vehicles are already EVs. They're public transportation systems EVs. I mean, I think we all know there are other things happening in other parts of the world that are pretty innovative that at some point the U.S. will catch up with. Um, Dan and I were in Scotland with the governor. Uh, I think that was still this year. Um, and they have a pretty exciting um, hydrogen program in, in certain types of vehicles driven by their offshore wind industry. But I, but I honestly don't think it's worth a lot of our time and energy right now because these are technologies that we, we may be in the pilot stage in the next several years. And it's not yet about incentives or regulation. It's about seeing what innovation happens and what might make sense for Maine in the future. So I do think our focus on, on uh, light duty vehicles and you know, the average Maine citizen driving and how we transition them to, to reduce their mileage and or use less fuel and ele electrify, I think that's, that's helpful and important. And Hannah, if I could just add one last thing, um, I would say that when you talk about buses, for example, um, Minneapolis and Montreal are both um, have been piloting and they're going to be good examples as northern cities um, for public transit and school buses. So um, I think there is some exciting work there. Great. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, I think we are getting some, there we go. Um, and I see a comment from uh, Senator Brownie Carson saying, can we, can we factor in the real advantage of getting high miles per gallon um, uh, in, in, in doing what Commissioner Bruce Van Note says? And I think that is a, a good thing. So maybe our metric isn't just like number EVs, it's like average miles per gallon or something like that. And so that's a challenge. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a sec as a way to see if we're, we're wrapping this up uh, the way we need to wrap it up. And these are my raw notes, so take them with a grain of salt, but it's truly trying to say, uh, what are we hearing from you all? How's the readability of this, guys? Can you read it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so I took down four points. It's something that then we need to take as staff and, and incorporate into uh, the new version here. One is Bruce's PowerPoint seemed to be hitting the mark, at least for those who spoke up, um, as a great opportunity, an equity opportunity, a way uh, to step up efficiencies, to, to get real life situations uh, more in the mix here, and appeal to folks in rural Maine, which we know is one of our key challenges in this process, right? Um, that being said, you need a well-designed trade-in program. We can't be incentivizing new internal combustions because we'll lock ourselves in for years uh, again. And Ken brings up the opportunity, hey, this reused EV market is probably going to be a bargain and a good thing. So let's think about that. So our design is important here. Third, right, we need to consider not just the vehicle, but the charging infrastructure, right? And let's not get distracted on our mandate to, to really work on charging infrastructure and make sure that that's part of the EV roadmap. And also its combination with housing and low income housing in particular was mentioned. And related to that is who's paying for this. And we can't let this happen where folks, particularly lower income families, are seeing their utility rates go up because of this and paying more. So we need to understand if, the, if, if that's the way we're funding it, we need to look at the affordability of utility costs uh, for low income homes as part of our equity analysis. And on the pilots, um, uh, Kate gave us that nice vision of the state of Maine does well when it works together, and we actually are the right kind of size of a state to do this well. 
And so if we can show people what's possible, we actually change people's thinking. And if you remember back to the working groups report, that was a big piece of some of the examples about community action around renewable power and things like that is demonstration projects really do work, right? And then there's this pending question of like, what really is our bridge to the electric truck? And that's a question mark in Hannah's reaction of, this is ongoing technology uh, changes that Maine will receive at some point, um, but may or may not be a big piece of our four-year plan. Okay, so this is me trying to capture so that we can sort of say, yeah, we got the big ideas here. This is what we need to make sure we're working on as we go forward. I'm gonna to toggle back to my Zoom screen. I'm gonna leave this up for a second when we discuss, but I wanna see, you know, uh, and you're gonna to have to raise your hand or just unmute your mic and shout out. Um, does this work for folks as a way of closing off these two conversations right now about the EV roadmap and the pilots uh, for medium heavy duty? Is there anything we else need to say right now to get this right and feel confident that staff is going to be writing? Yeah, go ahead. To David, I think um, the EV roadmap is a, the best, it was a great path forward. You know, Canada and Germany have been leaders in that. And, um, but I think you should in include in that a reference to just the, the transmission delivery work that the energy office will have to do in addition to it, because that's a longer process usually to, you know, to tie that together. Um, and I'm just concerned about that. On the heavy truck market or the bridge to electric truck, um, you know, light duty trucks right around the corner. I don't think there's gonna be a lot to, for us to do with that other than the market delivering on them. On the heavy duty uh, piece, the, the, what it looks like right now, and we had a meeting just before coronavirus in Las Vegas where we were able to see some of the equipment and new electric vehicles that are around the corner for construction in particular. But um, the chassis, the light, the light body chassis, so your, your, you know, your trash trucks and buses, I mean, those are, those are going to be ready to come out pretty soon. It's the, it's the heavier duty chassis where it's going to take longer. And I think that piece is um, down the road. So I think the department nailed it on the plan as to figure out the pilot piece for um, those kind of lighter, lighter bodies on those electric chassis. So, I think that's that's rock star moment. The other stuff, um, I think they have a test like Komatsu, for example, has a heavy hauler in a gravel pit. Uh, they've been testing out for the last year, and it has uh, regeneration uh, for electricity as they break going down uh, the heavy heavy mine. And that kind of stuff is still not ready for prime time. But that's sort of my update on the, the truck piece. I just want people to know. Thanks, Matt. That's helpful, Benedict. So I don't know if this is the right place for it or not, but we kind of allude to it uh, in the development of the transmission delivery network and how do we uh, make sure our low income people aren't impacted by that. And uh, traditionally transmission and delivery uh, development gets put onto electric grants. And I just feel that that would uh, disincentivize the transition to EVs if, if, if those costs get out of hand. And it's, uh, anyway, I just wanted to note that. Thanks, that's great. Pat? Just a quick commercial for biodiesel. Um, I'm the tree guy, so I'll always pipe in when, uh, when I see an opportunity, but uh, we have considerable interest in development. So it needs to be a part of our plan, 50 years you know, 30 years from now, uh, we'll, we may be more in a, in a biogenic uh, uh, cycle with fuels and those will be part of the solution. And uh, we're working on an RFS for those fuels at the federal level, which uh, is happening in, in other parts of the world. So just a, don't, it's not about just vegetable fuels. It's also about wood cellulose fuels. Great. Right. And Thanks, Pat. And we, again, those, those have separate actions in the, in, the, in the strategy area. So I just want to note that, that they're there. Uh, and it's just separate from this EV roadmap um, piece. Um, Ken Colburn? Yeah, the danger in making a list like this, David, is that everything seems to have equal merit. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I would just note that uh, with respect to the transmission distribution network, uh, we have the network adequate to deliver about twice the power that we normally use now. 
So we don't need to worry about transmission distribution in the near term, uh, certainly not for the next four or five years. We do need to worry about that as we uh, go beyond double our existing load into triple and quadruple, which will probably happen if we electrify everything, but not in the short term with the possible exception of real heavy duty stuff. But that's what we're talking about, only piloting at this point. In terms of cost, the uh, cost for EV to run an EV now is about a uh, gasoline equivalent of about a dollar fifty, dollar fifty-five a gallon, uh, as opposed to the two ten or so that we're paying. So uh, low income will already save money, and so I don't think we also have to worry too much about rates. Though of course, the PUC and indeed all of us should uh, be mindful of rate impacts on low income folks. Thanks. Right. Thanks. I just want to note stuff in the chat that's happening as well. Please take a look. Jesse Perkins, looking at your comments there um, about the societal costs of doing nothing and co-benefits, what uh, Brownie Carson's saying. So I think those are all really important pieces. Just in the interest of time um, and, and our ability to show that we can say, yes, this we're in the right zone. Are we in the right zone? Can we move forward and do one more quick thing before 1030? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jump in. Yeah, I just, I want to make a couple, a couple of quick comments. And I, um, you know, we're talking a lot about how we're going to, how we need to sell this to Mainers. And I, I raise this with the transportation work group, but we, we haven't, it hasn't come up in this conversation that a lot of the emissions that are happening from vehicles are happening from vehicles coming in from out of state. And, you know, at some point we need to ask ourselves, how are, how are those folks supporting what we're trying to do here? At least, in, you know, I, I feel like that's something that deserves a discussion. Um, and then just uh, kind of following up on what uh, Ken said about transmission um, and distribution, it's not, it's not, it'll not just be that piece, but where we need to build out the infrastructure, those costs as well. So we, we need the infrastructure. It absolutely should be part of a plan but how, how are those costs distributed um, as we build out that infrastructure, especially as we go into more rural Maine? And, and I know a couple people in the chat had talked about costs, like how are we gonna pay for this? And I, I, I think we just have to keep in mind um, the number of people who are coming into the state. And while I see a lot of Teslas from Massachusetts, um, uh, there are a lot of folks, especially uh, as folks are keeping it closer to home who are coming here, um, who are, are having an impact. Right. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Anything else before we close this up? Again, this is our us getting in the habit of like, oh yeah, we're in the zone. We'll send it back. Sarah and, and the team and everybody can take this, reformulate, push it back because we've expressed our core concerns. Are we good? David, I, yeah, if I could just ahead. chime in. Um, yeah. Dan Burgess reminded me to mention that we've been running a program to try and promote some of this stuff for the last two years, um, including a EV um, rebate program for the last one year. And um, we're lucky to have pretty good results with it, even though we've had a crazy year economically for the last six months. Um, but my observation from being the guy that has to implement some of these programs is that I would caution, I, I like the idea of making a list of things that should be considered in the roadmap, but I, I think we should be careful with whatever we come out of whatever comes out of this process and goes into our plan, quote unquote, that it's not too prescriptive about what the details of programs should be. I mean, I'm looking at this um, illustrious group of, of folks that are in this council, but I, I, I don't think this is everybody that I would want to hear from um, to, you know, make, get into the nitty gritty details of what the implementation details should be and so I I kind of like the idea of saying that's a good these are these are lists of things that should be considered in a roadmap but I'd be a little cautious about prescribing at this point what the specifics should be of the plans that would come out of that roadmap. Thanks that's great Michael. Um, Senator Carson is that a new hand or an, an old hand? No it's a new hand thank you. Great. Go ahead uh, please. Point. Um, I am certainly not an expert on how we build and finance the infrastructure for electrification of greater electrification of vehicles and more. 
we all know that there is going to be a debate on whether that infrastructure will be built privately with a, essentially a guaranteed rate of return to a CMP or somebody else um, through, uh, through private investment uh, or whether that will be a public investment. And I think in a bin or a parking lot here somewhere is what the, and I'm not sure this is the right time, but I just wanted to raise it, what the real cost advantages or savings may be to public investment for the electrification infrastructure, however and whenever it is done versus uh, the more, I believe, more expensive uh, private investment. Um, I, I believe it's an important point, but I'm not, uh, as I said at the outset, certainly not the expert. Thank you. Thank you. And that is a nice segue probably to our conversations around financing and funding that we want to do after a break. Um, I, wonder it, I wonder if we want to leave this here, um, the, these topics right here. And um, uh, we have just a two minutes or so before or we wanted to go to a break. And one of the things I wanted to do um, is just give Dan Burgess a moment. Well, first I wanna say thanks to everyone for having this good conversation on EV roadmap in the pilots. I think we got, we got a long ways. And the next, if you remember the next issue I wanted to try to get to before the break, which we can have a discussion about, but at least Dan can give us a little flavor of what was intended by that sort of a little bit lumpy action item on energy. And Sophia, if you wanna just throw that in the chat for a second, it's the one about maximizing benefits from main, <clears throat> from power generation and other things. And I wonder if Dan Burgess, if you're there, I'm just, yep, yeah, you're there. Um, if you were able to say just a word about the intent behind that action item, because I think some clarity would be helpful before we go on break. We'll take a break and then we'll come back and do some more issues. Um, so let's see if Sophia's dropping that in. Give me one second. I don't see it in just yet. There it is. Okay, great. Um, so this is a kind of a yep. lumpy one. Dan, do you want to just give us a sense of like, what's the intent here? What, what are we really saying through this action? Yeah, and I would uh, uh, ask Ken to also weigh in, who is an integral part of, of, of piecing this together. I think there's a few different section of, sections of this, so I'll try to go through it quickly. I know we're almost at a break, but, um, you know, I think the intent behind this, uh, at least the first part was ensuring that our uh, renewable energy uh, policies bring the most benefits to Maine. You know, we share a, a, a grid with, you know, the other New England states. We, same with our renewable portfolio standard markets. You know, I think that the intent here was to say, okay, how can we ensure that, you know, the, the benefits flowing from these, these projects that are to be developed, um, and the infrastructure that comes with it can be of most benefit uh, to the state, not just from an energy perspective, but also from an economic uh, perspective. Um, and then I think the group um, felt like there was a lot happening in both the uh, distributed generation and solar space that's um, kind of continuing to happen this summer or pri the prior to the summer when this came up, um, some great opportunities around, uh, around offshore wind um, and then kind of a, a note that there was a, a legislative commission on storage. I don't think our group felt necessarily like the, the energy working group should pick certain numbers and targets and goals, but did want to um, point out that those were uh, going to be integral resources that we'd need to figure out exactly how to um, uh, both incentivize uh, potentially uh, as well as um, ensure that there's the most benefits for Maine. Um, and then I think the last piece is that, you know, we need to make sure that if if and when we are building new infrastructure that it's done in a, a way that is uh, you know, least cost and that um, the assets that we have are, are maximized. So it's a kind of a, a, a very similar to the point that was just raised around you know, the infrastructure that we do have. So uh, Ken, did I, I miss anything there? Um, very little, I think, Dan, a nice, nice summary. The, the only part you missed is also kind of missed in, uh, in this text. And that is that the power sector itself is in the midst of a massive and fundamental transformation uh, to distributed energy resources, to managing demand, where we've only managed supply, to having uh, intermittent or variable generation resources on the renewable side. So um, that was the reason for the 
working group's recommendation about a significant effort by the state to dive into uh, that transformation, get our arms around it, and see how it can best benefit uh, the state of Maine. Um, it's kind of between the lines in this description, but doesn't come through strongly or clearly. So I, I just raise that up as being a, a piece of the mix as well. Thank you, Dan. Okay, thanks to both of you. And um, you know, essentially, if you had to put another headline on it, it's like embrace the transition, maximize the benefits for Maine, right? That's kind of the, the, well the, the big headline. Okay. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back and just make sure that if there's any questions about that, and then we're gonna dive into our financing conversation. Let's take a 10 minute break. So we'll be back here at 10, uh, 42, <laughs> maybe 10, 43. Feel free to turn off your screen, your microphone, you know, walk away from your screen, grab a glass of water, whatever. We'll be back uh, at 10, 43. Thanks, Cassie, for putting that slide up. See you in just a moment. Okay, we're back. Folks can go ahead and turn the cameras back on. And I would say, why don't we just go ahead and stop the screen share. We can see each other better. There we go. Okay, welcome back folks. Let's give just a second more to get some more people back with us fully. As always, it's encourage you to use your camera if you're in a position to do that. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so for our remaining time, in terms of working on the issues, we really want to spend the bulk of it on uh, these financing and funding action items uh, that you flagged as your priorities. Before we do that, I just want to double check that that where we ended the last conversation um, on the that energy action item that perhaps need a little more clarity. If we did get enough clarity, if there's other things uh, we'd want to say, I'm just throwing in the chat right now. What I heard is like the new headline on that action, right? Embrace the transition, maximize the benefits for Maine, right? And we know that there's some certain areas that you, the state of Maine should particularly explore. We're not setting targets or things on those. Melissa, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'd just like to point out that one of the benefits for Maine is going to be to keep forested land and prime agricultural soils out of renewable energy development. So just kind of want to keep putting that little detail into, these, into this conversation. Mm, and it's that siting issue, right? The siting issue of where we're going to put all of this renewable power. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And I think when we look at the collection of actions, um, if siting's not strong enough, we should definitely then figure out how we're going to elevate that to address the concern you're bringing up, Melissa. Okay. Is, does anybody else have a, something else they need to resolve urgently on this particular energy action based on what we've heard? Anything else? Okay, great. Okay, here comes the fun part, funding and financing. Okay, so we have action items already written on this. Some of them reflect some pretty delicate and difficult conversations and even negotiations in the working groups. Um, I wonder if Sophia, you could in the chat for everybody, including attendees, throw the three financing and funding related um, action items that folks clicked on aggressively in the survey. Um, and so we'll throw those in and then Hannah and or Melanie uh, can give us a frame, right? A frame of what this climate council can most effectively do in the voice it wants to lend to some really big messy conversations around funding and financing. And what the 40 of you could do that would be powerful in this moment. And then I, I wanna always draw our attention back to the written word, right? Because 
we're going to need to write something, right? So we have something written now in these actions. What do we need to change in the way this is written um, so that we're saying the most high value thing we can say is a climate council? Hannah, you want to give us a framing here that hopefully is more articulate than what I just tried to do? I, it's a, it's a, you weren't inarticulate, David. Thank you for trying and I'll try to, but I, I'm sure I won't, I won't answer the question fully because I think it's an, it's a complicated thing that we are grappling with here. Um, so I think one, uh, I was in a, we've been, we have been holding some background meetings with some creative funding and financing people. Um, you know, our office has been tasked with exploring a green bank, with, you know, thinking creatively about some of these ideas with, with Dan Burgess and Michael Stoddard and others. And so I want you to know we're doing some background work on some of these items. Um, and I think it's clear, I think as Ken and others have pointed out, that significant funding is needed for the work that we are putting on the table. I think there's just, I mean, absolutely no way um, to say that that is not the case. And I think the question is really, what is the role of the council? You are, we are not appropriators. Um, you know, we are not the governor writing a budget, um, but we certainly can emphasize the things that um, we most need and feel strongly need to happen first. Um, so I would say the, the challenge of, of some of this conversation is we are doing it in the context of a significant recession. Um, I think Melanie pointed out and, and Pat Kelleher and others on the call are, are currently grappling with um, uh, needed budget reductions in their operating budgets while at the same time we're asking those departments how do we start working on this climate work and so we're I think we're having there are still ways to make some of these things happen and, and folks like Amanda Beal should weigh in as well because I think you know she is thinking really creatively about things she's already doing, things that she can do more of um, uh, with the resources the state has, with federal funding sources that do come in. Um, the state still, even in a recession, spends a lot of money every year. And when we do it with kind of a new climate lens and, and how we implement that climate lens on current state's fu funding, that will be important. I mean, I, so I will say, I think there are opportunities, and I think by the next meeting, we want to bring some of them to you. I think there are some new funding sources that we are looking at um, through the federal government and other sources that I think will actually be exciting and allow us um, to do some work in the near term. Um, I think we have started to have conversations uh, with the governor, and I think it's an important thing for the Climate Council to weigh in on. Um, I think uh, state general fund bonding is an opportunity. and. Um, it still requires uh, state revenue to, to pay back those bonds, but borrowing has never been um, more accessible. The rates are incredibly low to zero, and I think there's just, there is an opportunity to do investment in infrastructure and putting people back to work um, through many of the things that have been suggested by this council. So I think thinking about um, a state bond package that is really bold and, and kind of lending, um, encouraging that is an opportunity. Um, I would also say I think um, we're starting to have more active conversations with our federal delegation. Um, there is a potential for significant change at the federal level about how they look at, at climate work and funding climate work. Obviously we are doing this in the context of election and we certainly cannot um, put our eggs all in the let's hope Washington saves us, but um, we're talking about significant investments and at a time when states are, are struggling. So I think uh, thinking about how we best position Maine for potential significant new federal investment um, is important. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's also important just to know what the state is already doing. I was texting Michael Stoddard. I think, you know, groups like Efficiency Maine, I mean, will be the ones implementing big chunks of our work, whether it's on the EV program or efficiency programs. Um, Efficiency Maine has a budget, which we've talked about, you know, is funded by ratepayers, by Reggie, um, a couple other funds, but it's in the, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, about $70 million a year. So we are, the state is making significant investments and we are, you know, actually just 
Sufficiency Maine just got a big award for being one of the best states in the country in doing this work. So I think we do need to not, I'm not sort of saying that as a dodge, but really better understand what, what the state is doing and how we can how we can better support that and, and put it on steroids, um, but do it in a way that's manageable for the people paying for it. So I would just say that I think um, the working groups, you know, thought about this um, and they struggled with it. And I think um, it is now kind of back on our plate. And as you saw, there were a couple of different studies recommended to think about funding that came out of the working groups, including a significant one on transportation. And transportation is a big one, super dicey. Joyce is here and others. Um, because transportation has such significant funding needs for climate work and for everything else. So um, I think, you know, I, in, my, in my opinion, I think the council needs to encourage bold action. We need to set bold goals for the four-year plan. We need to encourage potential funding sources, but it's not our job to come up with all of the ways that that will happen. I think obviously we all hope that the state um, gets out of this recession rapidly and, and gets to a recovery position in a year or two, which would actually, you know, might free up more state resources as well. So I'm not taking anything off the table. I'm just trying to provide context. I think, again, our goal as a council is to say what needs to happen and then do everything we can to encourage the state to take that action. But it's not our job to write those budgets or to implement them. So I think sort of the tension of that certainly will play out as well. Um, in in our funding discussions. Excellent. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some core interests that you have that you'd like to see reflected in the actual content that gets put in this climate action plan in your name, right? So let's talk a little bit about what's really important so that when we are adjusting the content as it's written today, we're as clear as possible understanding the sort of range of viewpoints and what's really important. Um, and I think Hannah really set us up for an interesting conversation. So please riff off what you heard from Hannah as we go on this conversation. All right, so let me just open it up. What is really fundamentally important for you that you wanna make sure is reflected in this text. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I just think it's essential that we underscore that we collectively come up with the resources to address the scale of the crisis we're facing and the scope and scale on the timeline that is not dictated by us, but is dictated by science. Um, and so to me, that has to be like our, our bottom line. Um, I think it's a point well taken that we're not going to be s deeply prescriptive. But I think the, the second thing I, that I think is um, really important is that the financing question obviously connects deeply to the equity question, the question of political durability and viability, and whether we're equipped to, to respond to the scope of the challenge. And I think bringing a progressive taxation lens to this and how are we going to progressively and equitably generate the revenue we need, I, th I would urge us to be explicit about that in some way, shape or form. We know from all the equity analysis that we went into this crisis with some of the deepest levels of economic inequality, which has consistently been um, exacerbated on the tax side of things that has only gotten worse through this pandemic. Um, taxing the wealthiest and tax equity is deeply popular. And I don't see a way that we fund these things if people feel like the transitions are somewhat regressively funded. The politics of that are just deeply, deeply challenging. Um, so I think in whatever way makes sense across a very diverse set of actors, we should put issues of tax fairness, taxing the wealthy, generating the revenue we need in equitable ways, like squarely on the table um, for a whole host of reasons. And I don't think we can do our work um, in the way we're charged with if we're not in some way, shape or form explicit about that. Thanks, Matt. 
other, I'd be interested to really riff off each other um, in addition to sort of changing gears. So um, I don't know, Lydia, if, if you want to speak to Matt's point or if there's another point you want to bring up. I wanted to bring up, um, basically I wanted to, uh, what Hannah was saying about bonding. Um, I really do think that um, this uh, establishment of a state infrastructure climate adaptation fund um, will help all of the shovel ready projects that are $325 million worth of projects that for resilience that are in the pipeline that need help to be funded. I think that that is, a, that is very important, I, I think, to our, our resilience and starting that now since it's already planned, we have, the, we have it ready to go. So to me, that's an important aspect that I would like to see in it. So I'm sorry I didn't follow up on- um, It's fine, it's that's good. It. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks so much. Okay, so we have a couple big ideas being put forward by, by you all. Um, you know, one is name, name a commitment, right? You as a climate council, name a commitment that we understand that this requires funding, right? This, and that funding should be at the scope and scale that the science and, and, and everything else tells us. That's one point. A second point is let's be equitable in our lens and put a progressive lens on this and how that funding is distributed and who actually pays for it. And we may be shooting ourselves in the foot if people perceive that it's unequitable or the burdens fall on, uh, on people disproportionately. And, um, and finally, Lydia's point about bonding and particularly uh, towards state adaptation funding and shovel ready efforts, that's a big piece that can be helpful. So those are three things I just heard. Um, if people feel uncomfortable with any of those three things, this is a great time to shout out. If people wanna build on those or offer something different, another great time to shout out. Ken? Thanks, David. Um, the equity has to prevail, as, as you indicated, but it, it can't come at the cost of effectiveness. Um, otherwise, it's a different kind of social program as opposed to a climate action program. Um, for that reason, I would suggest that one of the principles also be what's called Pigovian principles, or basically means polluter pays. Um, let's create revenues uh, from the causes of the problems. And, and that in large measure means home heating oil and uh, gasoline and diesel at this point in the state. Uh, unfortunately, those two also, those two categories also have regressive impacts. And that's where we need to ensure that some or much of the proceeds of that funding address those regressive impacts in a way to ensure equity. The, the point I'm trying to make is let's don't just do equity for equity's sake. Let's be effective and then address equity as part of the process. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Anya? Um, Ken, you basically just said what I was gonna say, so. Awesome, <laughs> nice. Well Plus done. one. <laughs> Plus one, all right, Kate as well. Okay, fantastic. Okay, um, again, we're naming those core things that we really want to see. And then it's, it's going to be written, right? It's going to be written into the report. Right now we have some language um, and we're trying to figure out what are the core things that are not working for us so we can adapt that language. Uh, Commissioner Beal. Um, this is a little bit of a different thought, but I, you know, I've thought a lot about some of the natural and working land strategies and there are opportunities where, you know, funding, funding some of those strategies could actually have a positive impact on the economy. So I think in terms of framing, we should really try to um, be talking about that in that way. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to speak to because Hannah mentioned it is just this idea of looking at existing resources within in the state departments. Um, we've already started doing that. We have, uh, for example, there are two grant programs, ag, ag development grants and specialty crop block grants where we have the ability to, in, to put in our own priorities. And starting last year, there's been a priority in both of those grants to um, look at practices that are climate friendly. So there's just a lot of opportunity there. And you know, as a department, we're prepared to do more of that. Excellent, thanks so much. Dan, were you trying to jump in? Um, yeah, I just want to um, just highlight the fact that 
uh, for us to accomplish these goals, there's going to be a, have to be massive investment in distributed uh, energy projects, whether that's at the residential or commercial level. And right now, one of the biggest impediments to that um, is the cost of is is the financing costs. You know, me as a small business, um, if I want to finance a solar project at my brewery, I have to borrow at commercial rates. Um, what we need uh, is is the state to um, use its power through bonding or whatever to offer small businesses and uh, you know residential projects the ability to borrow at a much lower rate because all of these renewable projects are high capital output up front and then of course you you reap the benefit that of that in initial investment over time but most people and small businesses don't have the capital up front so we need to make uh, capital cheap and I think that the state um, can play a large role there. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, Sandy? Thanks. Um, just a couple of things. One is uh, the issue of green bank comes up a lot as a as a perceived solution. Um, I'd like to know more about that. I guess that's up to me to go research that. But I could use some help if people want to throw a link into the chat that would be helpful about green banks. I see it as an opportunity for uh, more public private collaboration. Um, and so that's one aspect that I'd like to raise. And I also think that we can do a lot for our forest economy um, and for landowners if we emphasize and encourage uh, getting more of Maine's forests enrolled in the carbon markets. Um, that, that has many co-benefits. It keeps uh, working forests going, it keeps wood going to the mills, and uh, it helps our forests, which are already doing yeoman's work for uh, capturing carbon. Uh, it keeps them as forests, and we know that that's a primary objective, and it's the best way uh, to, to reduce our carbon in this state, to keep our forests as forests. All right. David, um, can I, I just want to make a quick comment to, in response to Sandy on the Green Bank, because I think it's, it's just a helpful big picture thing. Um, we have been convening some conversations, so we have some agencies in Maine. Efficiency Maine, Maine Trust makes certain kind of loans to certain, for certain projects. Uh, FAME does, MTI does innovation, Maine Municipal Bond Bank does, does um, more large infrastructure projects. Um, there are probably a couple other agencies I've left out. I mean, CEI is doing a lot of private um, projects. So we're trying to, um, again, as kind of part of a legislative uh, push on this as well, figure out what those gaps are. We, we won't really have them by December 1, but I would say that our this council, like comments like Dan's, help us focus on what it is we need more financing for. Because a, a green bank doesn't really solve a problem. It's a financing mechanism. So we need to understand what are the things we need to finance a lot more of and how would the cost of capital via a state agency like FAME versus a green bank, um, you know, what are the pros and cons? And again, you know, we could start a, you know, I think technical expertise on the part of the lending institution is needed in Maine across a number of entities. So again, whether we start a new entity or focus one of our two existing ones on, on upping their expertise, that's really our, our area of conversation. I mean, clearly more capital to whatever of these financing institutions, whether it's a new green bank or one of the other ones, uh, that is clearly needed. I mean, Efficiency Maine got a huge slug of money from the last Recovery Act in 2009 that they're still using and lending out to people in Maine to do good projects. So I do think there's some talk, conversation at the federal level about a national green bank, and we're starting to talk to some of the folks working on that about how Maine would utilize it if an opportunity like that ever came available. But I actually think, again, the role of the council is to prioritize those things that require greater finance in the long term. Clearly big infrastructure projects for communities will need multiple forms of both grants and long-term financing options. Um, I think the other gaps, whether it's you know big offshore wind projects, commercial solar projects, really understanding what the market's not covering is, is what, you know, I think we as, as staff, but also as a whole council are, are need to wrestle with. Thanks, Hannah. I see Buck, do you wanna, Sandy Buck, do you wanna jump back in? 
No, I, that's, a, that's an old hand. Ah, sorry. Thanks, Anna. Awesome. Kate and then Anya. Sure, I'm just thinking about what principles haven't, trying to get to your question, David. Um, I think just again, reflecting on how far we've come uh, since we passed the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, what we've done is create a permanent revenue stream for Efficiency Maine to do this phenomenal work that we've been really reflecting on. And I think one of the principles we need to recommend is something that looks to a permanent funding stream from much like um, my Ken was saying earlier, you know, how do we get a stream that's in, that's solid, that we can count on, then we can design innovative programs around that, just like we've done on um, through Efficiency Maine. Um, the other principle I just want to touch back on, I think Lori might have said it at the very end of the last section, so bring it into this section, which was um, rebringing up uh, that we live in a region, we have people who come in and out of Maine all the time, and let's frankly take advantage of that fact as a revenue stream um, through some sort of approach that's regional in the idea in the long term maybe that's maybe it's a little bit more further out just regarding a regional approach the other only other thing i will say is we're seeing significant excitement from places that we would not have initially expected it like um, business community and uh, automakers so just put that into the mix but the core principles i just wanted to bring up that's great thanks kate anya yeah, actually, Kate, that's a good segue to what I was going to say um, uh, on the topic of um, of regional funding systems. Um, just want to push again uh, the Transportation Climate Initiative, which has been um, supported by the youth constituency, um, given that it, it, it is a, um, it turns out to be a, an equitable um, funding mechanism, but um, it has the opportunity to um, generate uh, over $150 million a year. So I think that could be a really fantastic way for us to answer some of these questions. The other thing that I just want to bring up too is um, the consumer owned utility, which um, Ken just mentioned in the chat as well. Um, but that has uh, the opportunity to save Maine billions of dollars um, on, on year one. And uh, I just see that as a, as a really clear way forward in terms of energy generation. So just wanted to, to make sure that um, those were included in the mix in, in some, some proportion. Thanks, Anya. Judy? So while we're talking about ones that are controversial, thank you, Anya, for opening that door. Um, real estate transfer tax as an opportunity to generate income. Um, I've seen it generate millions in other areas. I think we can create a program if we've really got into the details that, that, that considers equity and that um, could generate a lot of new money. And with think how much money we could have made already this year. Just think with the way things, and 19% nine, increase in real estate in the statewide. So I think right. that's worth considering. Thanks, Judy. Um, Lydia? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, reemphasize the consumer owned utility. I believe that that was, it's part of the energy working group strategies and we must keep it in there. Uh, that's very important because it really is about financing in the, in the best possible way. Um, and also maybe the establishment of a main power authority as a quasi independent governmental entity. Um, so I, I think that that's something that we really should include. And I don't think we should we should wait. It, you know, the legislature's working on it as well. But I think that we recognize it from a climate council standpoint that it's very important to have in our report. Thanks. I just want to clear up with Dan Burgess and Ken the mention of the consumer owned utility in the in the actions right now in the in the working group and how that is referenced. Um, just because I think it's important to say, Dan or Ken, can you just weigh in? What, what's the actual reference there on the consumer-owned utility? Um, I, know, 
I don't think it's, uh, it goes too deep, um, David, but it was referenced in the working group's recommendations um, under that category that uh, Sophia shared um, of uh, create the structures and mechanisms necessary to finance effectively. Okay, and it's put forward as one thing to explore. Is it an official recommendation that uh, thou shalt do this? No, all, all of these were explore these options. Uh, the two that were most concrete, given that they're most well known at this point are uh, enhanced revenue bonding and the Green Bank because it's so well precedented in other states. Uh, but the main power authority and consumer owned and then of course carbon pricing were also mentioned as uh, meriting investigation. Great, okay, that's really helpful, okay. How about I do a quick screen share like I did last time? <clears throat> Just give me one second to, to, to pull this together. It's gonna to take one second for me to share. Let's get a window into my raw notes here. <clears throat> you and everybody observing. Um, okay, this is my raw notes and they could suffer from uh, errors and omissions, just to be clear. Um, is that readable for folks? Yeah? Shout out if it's not, please. Okay, so I heard a bunch of principles uh, and I try to pull some things out of the chat as well. Uh, what we mentioned already, these are things we mentioned already. Um, and these are new things that were coming up in this conversation about, think about a permanent funding stream. I copied a uh, brownie idea of climate fund um, uh, from, the, from the chat into this. Um, and then thinking about how our out of state visitors who are driving and creating emissions in Maine are part of our funding solution. Um, and then framing these issues around the positive economic uh, impacts they can have. For instance, national working, working lands actions can have some real positive economic impacts. And then we we're some mentioned some specific areas of emphasis, the bonding, particularly around the state ad adaptation funding, very important uh, for at least one of you. And uh, this is our opportunity to shout out if we have concerns about these things. Um, upfront capital, Dan's point, right? Uh, this is a big issue that um, if we can make upfront costs less through cheap funding, um, that could really unlock a lot of opportunity. Um, the Green Bank idea is something that's being uh, discussed and looked at. Um, and what Hannah brought to bear there was it would be extremely helpful for this group to say what really we need to focus our, our, our funding emphasis on. Um, and then we can start to figure out the structure on the back of that. And then agencies can then figure out how to, to implement. Um, and then there's a mention of specifically getting forests en enrolled in carbon markets. Just in the other category are things we need to be exploring uh, in coming out of you as these are worth exploration the consumer owned utility is one of them along with the green bank and the other possibilities. And then Judy puts on the table potential using real estate tax, if I heard you correctly, Judy. So this is what I've heard. And, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, pull it down into pieces that folks, oh good, I see a bunch of hands shut up. <laughs> so Dan, why don't you go ahead and react uh, to what we have here on the screen? Yeah, I just wanna, you know, offer a few words of caution about diving into the tactical um, mechanics of all this when it comes to funding and how we're gonna fund this. I don't necessarily see that as our charge and I think we risk, um, uh, I think we risk our, uh, some of our credibility and I think um, uh, bipartisan support if we start going down the road of offering up um, funding mechanisms like income tax, estate tax. Um, I don't know, while at a personal level that might be what I would like to see, I don't know that it's gonna serve the uh, best interests of this panel by diving down into those tactical funding issues that I think are really policy issues that policymakers should have to um, grapple with. Thanks, Dan. And I think, Judy, you've got your hand up. Do you want to um, piggyback on that comment? 
I would like to, one clarification is absolutely not a real estate tax, it's a real estate transfer tax, which is wicked different than a real estate tax. Thank you. And I guess I would also throw up um, local option sales taxes. And I actually kind of disagree with the previous comment only because of the exhortation we've been we've received several times to be bold and to make recommendations that um, really push the envelope. We don't have the final word, but I think we need to suggest things that have been demonstrably helpful in other places because I, I really think they have and, and that we can then explore how they might be done in Maine and with an equitable lens. So I guess I, 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 I think we need to stick with some bold ideas. That's my clarification. Thanks, Judy. Great. Uh, Ken and then Benedict. Yeah, David, on the wording on their specific areas of emphasis for revenue bonding, the dashes may suggest that that's definitional and it should certainly include adaptation funding, but is not meant to only be adaptation funding, uh, mitigation, infrastructure, other, other efforts. Thanks. I think that does. Great. Thanks, Ken. Benedict? Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, one of our principles, I think, should be uh, you know, we, we got to be cost effective in our approach so we can get the most done. And, and I think some of those things uh, included in some of the comments above, you know, uh, you know, there's a study by Dr. Richard Silkman about the uh, consumer owned utilities and power authority that could really help stretch our dollars. Uh, you know, the regional approach, uh, I think that, that with the TCI was mentioned previously. I don't know enough about that, but that's one way to help, you know, include the people that visit our re visit our state and the region and uh, and help get the funding source from, you know, the polluters, uh, you know, fossil fuels. So I, I, I just think that's important to state. Not that I'm for or against any of that, but it, definitely big lovers, I believe that we should talk about. Yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, Commissioner Kelleher. Uh, thanks, David. Um, you know, these funding conversations are always difficult and Hannah, I think, expressed the kind of the conflicting, um, conflicting pace that uh, the commissioners are in right now dealing with budget reductions um, and trying to figure out the funding piece of this. Um, I'm, I feel like we're in a kind of a chicken and egg situation where we haven't finished the prioritization work and we're talking about the funding components. Um, it, it, this is an incredibly important conversation. I, I, I would just reemphasize Commissioner Beale's comments about existing resources um, and how we can uh, potentially leverage those working together, working with our partners. I mean, it can't be the state alone here. Um, and that's been uh, certainly clear with all of the comments that are being made. Um, I, I think we're going to be in a pos position that we'll know a lot more uh, as we get into the session and see the next revenue forecast uh, of where we're going to be. But I, I think we just need to move forward with caution on the funding side of this. Um, and, and that is not really the serious nature of this. I think this is probably some of the most important work we can be doing. So. Um, set back to that conflicting role, right? I mean, that conflicting message that we have right now. So, um, and I, and I, I just quickly, I've got to jump off um, early to deal with an issue. So if you see me drop off, it's not for lack of interest. It's I've got a, an issue that just came up. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, Pat Strouch. Yeah, just as the uh, business community spokesman, I just get nervous about our I, I think some folks are talking about this. I, I don't think we need to be raising taxes on the business community. Um, and I'm getting concerned about that. The real estate transfer tax, and Judy will kick my shins next time she sees me, but uh, 
you know, should we really be charging woodlot owners for uh, transferring land uh, when they're not really part of the problem? So there's an equity issue there. And in general, taxing, uh, make, I have to attract capital into the state. And so when we start raising general taxes, um, uh, it's puts a dampening effect on that. The only other thought I had was, uh, I thought Sandy's thought about enrolling more uh, forests and carbon markets is interesting, but that only generates funding for the landowners. That's their, it's their um, equity, it's their product that they have to sell. So it might not add to the, to the uh, funding challenges we've got, um, other than it'll help perhaps uh, landowners keep their land in forest land, which might be what he was getting at. Great, okay, thanks. I, I'm getting a, a message from Lori that you're trying to jump in. Lori, why don't you go ahead, please? Thank you. So um, a couple different points on the kind of issue of how deeply we should go into um, funding. It seems like we at least have an opportunity and I've been kind of taking some notes to, to lay out some possibilities on the revenue side, on the borrowing side, on the grant side um, and that this group may have lots of different ideas and as well as folks who are paying or listening in where a combination of those things as well as looking at um, opportunities to, to leverage um, some of the program funding that's already in place uh, where there's interconnections between our work and other work going on, whether it's in housing or transportation. Um, it seems like a nice opportunity for us to lay that out. Um, this is probably not a popular um, opinion, but I just, um, and ARP actually doesn't have policy on the consumer-owned utility, so we've not weighed in on this issue at the legislature, but there is some research that shows it doesn't necessarily, uh, consumer-owned utilities don't always bring down costs for consumers, so I just, I caution us, and I, I'm happy to try to pull some information for the council, but I just caution us to, to be careful on that issue. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Lydia, go ahead, please. And I, and I think that's why we need to make sure that we get as much study done on a consumer owned utility. Uh, and we have to keep that out there because it could be, it could be part of the mix. But also, um, you know, there may be some legal impediments and some ways that we can uh, streamline um, funding abilities, funding mechanisms that to get to local st regional uh, groups. And so I want I, I don't know enough about it, but I would like to hear from um, our state treasurer on are there things that simple things that we can do to accelerate, streamline uh, the ability to to get funds. And I think I think you know that's kind of like the, the, I'm, I'm looking at um, low hanging fruit uh, here to help accelerate the pace of all of this work in general. How do we accelerate the ability to get our funding? You know, what, 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 what can we do about that? Is there structural things that we can do, legal things that we can do? Um, and I'm not sure the answer to that, but I wanna ask the question and see and, and, and get an answer to that. Yeah. So Lydia, I just wanna do a quick check. On that kind of issue in the kind of timeline we have as a climate council, it really sort of raises a question, at least in my mind, from a procedure standpoint, if that's the kind of thing where we can say in the action plan, focus on streamlining funds, the state treasurer's office is critical in that, and we hope there's a process going forward to look at it, as opposed to say, this climate council is gonna set up conversation with the state treasurer and figure all that out before we have a draft on November 11th or whatever. Or uh, yes, I, I agree, yeah. but I think, I think that it's just, we're, we're looking at ways to accelerate the process yeah. because that's what we're at. We're, you know, what, what, what's, what, what impediments are in our way to, to accelerate the process? And that, that's just, how do, we, how do we do that? And that should be looked into, essentially. Right. Okay, I've got two folks in the chat trying to uh, tell me they want to get in. First, Matt Marks and then Michael Stoddard. Matt, why don't you go ahead, please? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I kind of draw the commissioner's feelings about uh, the, the ways that we can raise funds for some of the projects we're talking about. I think it'd be essential to put together that list first of, and the costs of what we expect, uh, you know, the concepts we're moving forward with before we talk about funding. And a good example would be like, I, I know you brought up the real estate transfer tax, but is that a discussion that is about housing 
uh, to fund the housing initiative, or is that something you'd see outside of that where those funds may be already dedicated? So I think it's important that we get that list together first uh, before we go down too far down that road, uh, just to make sure that we're covering our basis on what our actual you know, costs are projected to be. Uh, the other thing is on the consumer-owned utility. I have weighed in on that before. Um, I'm, I'm, we're interested uh, as, a, as a contractors who build utilities. We have folks who have worked in places where uh, some of the projects had actually been stalled where there was a consumer uh, owned trying to take over a private utility and it uh, put like a 10 year stall on progress. So I'd like to look at both. I, I think it's, if this, if that's a objective, I would just say that it'd be nice to hear uh, from both parties who are experts in it uh, before we go too deep in that um, world, I guess. Yeah. And I think, thanks Matt. And I think I'm going to make a similar comment as I did with uh, around sort of hearing from the state treasurer, which is, boy, we really don't have a lot of time to, to like go into the pros of cons and uh, dig deep on the research on that. So I think if folks are comfortable with saying, this is something worth studying, that that may be as far as you get on something like the consumer owned utility or the green bank or these kinds of issues, right? Because we just don't have the, the time and the, and, the, and the month we have to really hear and give it its proper due. Um, Michael. And, and can I just add one quick Go thing ahead. on that, on, on all of these comments, is to, to understand that our work is not done. I mean, clearly the action plan should prioritize the issues that we think it's worth the state considering, better understanding, pursuing, and I think clearly the consumer owned utility is a good example of one that is, is currently receiving heavy debate in the legislature, has a huge study, is likely to have, was about to have another study recommended before the legislature was cut short. Um, so I just think to, to think about how we put placeholders of we want to stay involved and engage in that issue long term on issues where we won't know an answer on December 1. So I, I guess I just would say that prioritizing those things where we need to make strong recommendation and then those areas we want to stay engaged would be helpful. That's really great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, Michael Stoddard. Thanks, David. Um, I just wanted to circle back to um, one of Daniel Cleveland's point about the upfront capital that you have in your bulleted list there. And it got me thinking, um, I've been bouncing around these financing questions for about 10 years now, and I know just enough to be a little bit dangerous, but, I, but it's, it's pretty complicated. And I've seen a couple of bills come through the legislature proposing that we do more with financing. and. Um, I, I, I still think we don't really have our arms around what the exact barriers are in the different situations that we're trying to address with financing and which is, what elements of financing um, are lacking from the existing, what's, exist, what's available. And so I don't know if it might be something we would want to recommend specifically get further study. Like, I, I can't remember what our recommendation is from the working group, but, you know, we might want to put a finer point on it that it really should be studied as to what are the specific barriers. And, and I hear a bunch of different comments from people pointing out ways that additional financing could be helpful. And, but it seems to me that lots of us have different ideas in mind of what it is we're trying to address and the situations that we're trying to address, like getting financing for a consumer owned product, like a car or a heat pump is a pretty different thing than getting financing to build a transmission line in, or a water sewer treatment plant, you know? So, uh, so I think we should look at it about, and, and another one that's been mentioned is generation. So the, the power generation needs financing, the infrastructure needs financing, consumer goods need financing, but I think they face different barriers. One of the barriers that they don't face is, face is availability of capital. Like there's tons of capital. Around. Daniel Kleban can get a loan if he wants to. He just he's saying that the interest rate is, is expensive and the term is short. And so it's, doesn't seem that attractive. At least that's what I think I'm hearing. So I, I think we should get into, not us here, but I think somebody needs to really break it down into what the problems are we're trying to solve. Because I noticed, I don't think there are any bankers on this group of us and we're not hearing from them, but they, you know, they, they make, they have a robust um, role in our economy and they I uh, think should be heard from about what it is that 
the, the private sector can solve for these needs and what it is that it's not so good at solving. Um, and then uh, this is, I, since I have the mic, I can't resist throwing in this one other thing that goes to addressing the issue of regressive costs. Um, I, I and my friend Dan Brennan at Maine Housing get, find ourselves involved in trying to do programs to um, help put our thumb on the scale for equity to uh, benefit low income customers in Maine. And it is super complicated. There are so many variety of challenges um, one thing that I feel like might be another good candidate for some kind of a study, some kind of a blue ribbon commission or something that we might recommend is to just have people, have some group focus on how we could do better at um, delivering benefits back specifically to low income customers. Um, and, and so I'm thinking, for example, we don't have a good way to just get things back to them. Um, and if we wanted to, in the future, be assessing some kind of energy taxes or any other kinds of costs that would tend to fall, just, you know, hit them disproportionately, and we wanted to return the benefit back in some enhanced weights, uh, Dan, Brennan, and I can do it. If they're on a list, we can give them a bigger rebate. We can double the rebate or triple the rebate, or we can pay for the whole thing. But that only works for the handful of people that come through the program. It doesn't touch all the other people that should be getting some kind of a benefit too. And I just think we need a more robust mechanism that works better and is more efficient. And I think it would give us way more latitude to be more aggressive with some of the things we're talking about here. Um, and so I think it's something that should be fixable. Thanks, Michael. Melissa. Um, thanks, Michael. In response to, to your point, I think that something we haven't talked about and that um, I mentioned in my comments to the survey yesterday is the need for some new working groups moving forward. Um, and I think an equity working group, it would be an important um, idea to bring up to the council. Um, I think that there's also been a lot of talk about education. So the possibility of an education working group and um, maybe I, th I think an energy working group was also um, suggested in one of the action items. So I think at some point we should have that conversation. Maybe it's for the next meeting, but um, that's just something that I've been thinking about how we're going to move forward with the council as we um, look to the legislative session and then implementation. Thanks, Melissa. So before I wrap this up, I just want to say, if someone hasn't said a word today, like you haven't said a single word yet today, but you really do have something to say, this is a great chance to chime in if you haven't gotten in the mix yet. So anyone who hasn't spoken up yet, this is a wonderful time to just jump in. Yeah, Ivan? So, um I'm in that category rarely, but uh, I am today. And the, I guess I just wanted to share one concept that keeps coming up and it has to do with um, equity as well as cost effectiveness, as well as effectiveness in reaching the goals, uh, obviously of greenhouse gas reduction and, 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 and resilience. Uh, and, and the term I think of is program penetration. And I'm thinking particularly about, I think Pat brought it up earlier, but um, for a lot of the folks in Maine that are living in rural areas, um, and, and as someone's talked about science for a long time relative to climate change, and we see it in COVID, just having the facts right doesn't sell the program. Uh, and so um, while we can deal with the regressive nature uh, by our clever policies, we've got to sell it to basically everyone in Maine that we possibly can, that they think this is a, a good program and this is the way it's benefiting them. Uh, and I'm not sure that's probably embedded in how this gets played out now and in the legislature, um, but I think that's really important because if uh, a, a major sector of Maine dismisses this as just the climate program and, and doesn't engage, uh, we're gonna miss a, a big opportunity. So thanks, thanks for that. No, that's, thanks for that reflection. Okay. All right. Anybody else who hasn't chimed in yet today at all? Who has something on their mind they want to share? Okay. 
Great. So um, you saw the kinds of notes I was taking and there's other notes being taken right now. And it feels like there's a way to consolidate those notes down into new language that makes those action items stronger, that makes those action items reflect what you're trying to express right now. I'm not gonna try to do a summary beyond what you saw on my screen. I'm not capable, like my brain's not strong enough to do that in real time. But I feel like the guts are there. Um, and I feel like with some thought and reflection at the back end of this meeting, that we can try to really pull that into a new set of action items that are related to the financing and funding challenges um, that you want to wrestle with. Okay, so I'm feeling somewhat confident. I don't have a poll set up right now to test if you're feeling confident <laughs> um, about our ability to do that. But I think this was a very powerful conversation and I really appreciate you diving into it. Um, okay, I want to, as we end the day, uh, I want to uh, riff off something that Melissa teed up, which is there's some pieces in here that you've noted feel to be missing. And you've noted it in the survey, you've noted it in comments in these meetings, and we've been taking note. And we don't have an exhaustive list, but we have a list of things that, um, that look like, uh, that look like uh, are items that um, have been named by a bunch of folks. And I'll, I'm going to quick do this. And uh, Hannah's reminding me separately that we were going to mention another item that had gotten four uh, mentions in the survey, which is about infrastructure. I'm going to circle back to that in just a moment. I want to go first to this issue of some missing items because I think it actually isn't a better flow from our conversation. We have a slide on this. And Cassie, I wonder if you want to throw up that slide. Um, these are things that we've heard repeatedly from you. And it isn't that we're sure that everybody's totally aligned on it, but we feel like we've heard it a lot. Um, one is the issue of education. And we've heard that a couple of times and it really didn't have a great home inside the working groups, although it was mentioned by a couple of working groups. Um, but really, what do you as a climate council wanna recommend in terms of helping strengthen what is uh, part of curriculum and what's part of the education, particularly for our kids? So that's one issue that's come up. And that's a little bit separate from the sort of messaging and communication that you do more broadly. Uh, Ivan's point of like how people see themselves in this, this is more specifically about education, educating, educating kids, right? And I'll have, um, I think Hannah might even do a better job than I can for sure about explaining some of these items. So I wonder if Hannah, if you just wanna take the lead in, in sort of walking us through what we've heard uh, on, on some of these items that, that aren't as well represented in the document as we'd like them right now. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you did a good job starting off on the climate education. I know that's an issue that Anya's brought up. We actually had a whole group of youth pitch us on this and we've actually had a new person uh, join the Climate Council helping to pitch in from the Department of Education, Paige Nichols, um, who's interested in, in kind of engaging on this at some point. Um, I'm gonna go just through a couple of the other ones, but I wanna emphasize that there were a number of comments in your suggestions. I said this at the, at the top, when you sort of, you were giving feedback about what we should discuss, people kind of, there was a push and pull, like I wanna emphasize wood products more, I want to avoid burning more wood. There was a, I think this, this time frame should be moved up, I, I'm worried about it being too aggressive. So. I, I want to make sure to note that we anticipate some individual conversations with all of you as we try to form some of these things because people really weighed in with, with strong feelings and comments and, and those are not lost. Um, I also want to emphasize that on the adaptation resilience side, there was a lot of helpful comments about the need to provide more clarity on the priorities. And that is something I think our team will be looping back with you individually um, in the next uh, you know, really we're talking about a couple weeks. So we're all trying to work aggressively um, to stay engaged and make sure what we bring to you at the next meeting really hits the mark. Um, so just, I think the equity um, assessment just came out and we are looking kind of through each of the recommendation area about how do we enhance equity outcomes in each of the major areas as part of the climate action plan. So that's a pretty blanket one and a number of you put that in the survey. 
Um, the next three items are ones that came up, um, and I wanna just say that they came up from some of us in state government as well, because these three were all items that were in the last legislative session, um, received uh, a lot of support from the legislature, but died because the legislature never came back. So um, the adoption of Maine's appliance standards, um, adopting a phase down of HFCs, um, happy to give longer explanation at a later date, but they are super pollutants for emissions um, that uh, the governor put in a bill um, as many states across the country are working on this issue. So it's part of our greenhouse gas mix um, and something that we had bipartisan support uh, for a bill before the legislature. Um, the next thing is the support of seed pace financing. So commercial property assessed clean energy program actually may hit a little bit to what Dan was talking about. Again, a bill that was going through the legislature had been negotiated. Um, I think that these three items are things that we didn't put, um, I think the working group said, oh, the legislature's dealing with it, that bill will pass, we don't need to put it in the report. I actually think emphasizing these things would be helpful. They're actually pretty significant um, parts of climate plans in other parts of the country, and they're things, again, we're, we're kind of near the finish line on, so I think this group endorsing them would be helpful. I will say the other er major area of the work that has been brought up um, is just the need for more uh, emphasis on clean energy um, uh, economy ideas. And again, I think that you will be um, excited by the report that Dan Burgess and Melissa and the Governor's Energy Office is working on with our team. I think it has some concrete suggestions on both innovation and workforce. And those are things that we may want to add um, to recommendations. So that will definitely be on the agenda for the next meeting of how do we incorporate that report about, you know, because I think it really is the essence of economic recovery and climate coming together and it is certainly timely. So those are just a couple of the ideas um, that came out and I don't, this list is not exhaustive because again there are other things we want to keep talking about um, with each of you that you mentioned but this is sort of the Sort of some of the highlights that came out of um, your comments in the survey. Great, thanks. And we don't have time right now to walk through these in great detail and get feedback and all that, but we welcome you weighing in, uh, perhaps over email or other ways, uh, just to say, uh, help, under, help us understand where folks are on this. And we'll bring these in a slightly more formed way uh, next time we meet. Um, and if there's any sort of immediate immediate feedback on this, uh, we could do a quick round, like a minute or two right now, uh, but I don't wanna get sucked into deep conversations on all four or five of these right now. And, and so I open it up, like if someone has something burning to say about these issues, uh, otherwise let's just keep rolling um, and know that we're working on trying to write something coherent about it. Uh, can I just add something? Um, yeah. What about the report on the uh, uh, the economic recovery committee that just came out? H how are we, we? We had talked about hoping that that our our climate council's report and their report would have a lot of synergy. Um, we haven't mentioned that, and and I wonder what we're doing about that. Um, good point. Good point, Representative Bloom. I would say that. Um, the ERC, the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee, has actually convened an energy uh, working group of which Dan Burgess is engaged. The Clean Energy Economy Report that's under production is actually going to be presented to them as well. Um, I see Matt Schlobohm who has his hand up. He actually is on both groups and there might be a couple of others of you on both groups. So I think we are, I mean I will say like broadband is a major point of emphasis of that group and it is absolutely essential for our climate goals. And I think there are some complementary things and there are areas where we're trying to stay coordinated, um, areas where there's exciting economic opportunity, but ability to help meet our climate goals. So we are trying at both the staff and, and um, overlapping member level to continue doing that. We don't know exactly what their final recommendations will be, but we're trying to make sure they're, we're staying, staying coordinated. Hannah, would it be helpful to also talk about timelines there because Lydia, you mentioned there, there was a report that came out. The, the ERC had a report of interim things in, in July 15th, but will not have a report until the same timeline as the Climate Council, so on December 1st-ish. 
late November, um, December. And so there is some weaving together that's happening right now. In fact, there's a meeting tomorrow morning of their energy ad hoc group um, to try to weave together these two things. And they can provide ideas for you and you can provide an energy lens for them. Uh, so that's what, what's going on. Matt, uh, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, just two, two quick comments. I like, <clears throat> I like the um, general direction of the additional recommendations. Friendly amendment on the education one, if we have the bandwidth and capacity to just include um, adult education in that, I think, and like broader public education, obviously we should embed it in K through 12, but I do think US history is loaded with these tipping point moments where you reach a certain level of consciousness in the society. And I think to do that and do the things we want, we need to, um, reach out more broadly to you know people who are not in uh, school as well and then just a plus one on the clean energy and jobs framing and connection points great excellent okay um and ambassador dana please go ahead thank you david uh, i would support the idea of an equity working group I, th I think that's a great suggestion and i would love to see tribal sovereignty be a central focus of that working group Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. All right. So, um, excellent. So let's do this. There was one other little thing we just wanted to make sure you had a chance to look at. We can drop that slide off now and just uh, stop the share for a second, Cass, if you don't mind. Um, and I, and uh, because we have a few minutes here, I think we should do it. Um, and Sophia, if you're still there, if you could put that very last piece in the chat about developing and adopt citing materials and design standards. There was one more of the pieces in the survey that got at least four mentions from you. Thanks, Sophia. That's great. Um, and it was in the infrastructure strategy. And we're not sure why it got so many mentions unless there's some confusion or some real concerns about it or something else. And so we just wanted to provide an opportunity for folks to say, oh yeah, no, this is why I, I wanted to have a quick conversation or a longer conversation about this. So if you um, have something to say about this issue, let's take a minute or two and just put those concerns out on the table or what's going on in your head on that. And that way we can understand better uh, what we could do to make this stronger or more appropriate. So if you and, and just a folks, quick, yeah, quickly, um, I think that Taylor or Joyce might want to make a comment because I believe that this item came out of transportation. And so it was really about major infrastructure projects. I mean, this, this one, the way it's phrased here could, you know, there's broad implications and some of these same suggestions were made in different ways by other working groups thinking about larger land use issues, but I'm just wondering if, if someone wants to add a specific about where this came from. Does anybody uh, recognize this? Yeah. Yeah, I think Joyce uh, might be on the phone now, so I okay. will chime in. Um, so I think um, at least most of this originated in the transportation working group. Um, and the strategy is basically to help prepare infrastructure, so culverts, wastewater treatment plants, uh, coastal bridges, um, prepare those things to be climate ready. And it includes developing and adopting standards for the siting of new infrastructure. So this would be, um, you know, so you don't build a new uh, wastewater treatment plant in a floodplain. Um, for the construction materials, making sure that those materials you're using are durable enough to withstand the elements. And then the design guidance um, for the infrastructure, making sure that um, new coastal bridges are built to a certain elevation so that they can withstand uh, anticipated sea level rise. So uh, the standards would be used across the state and revisited over time to make sure that they're consistently uh, meeting what the state needs to uh, minimize the risk of disaster. That's great. Thanks, Taylor. That's really helpful. 
So if, if you had clicked this and it's still bugging you, this is a moment or for whatever reason you feel like it's important to talk about it, this is a quick moment to say why. Otherwise, we'll just wrap up for the day. Uh, Kate? Don't, don't set me up that way. It's like people who say, well, I'm the last to speak before the drink. Lunch. No, yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I was trying to remember if I raised it. Um, so yes to everything Taylor said. I think I might have raised it more in context of, again, the state in the last year, the legislature in the last year, two years, have done a phenomenal work in the renewable portfolio standard and setting parameters of what counts and what doesn't. We're doing that with uh, solar siting law. And so, and I know Director Burgess is thinking about it on offshore wind, but I think we've, we've set a path for ourselves on putting parameters on how to do good siting, how to do good renewables. And this, I think we just wanted to kind of bump it up the language a little bit more. I can send some suggestions in. I don't think we need to address it right now, but I think I might've said something. That's great, excellent. Okay, anything else we wanna say on this issue that's critically important? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna round up. And before I, I turn it over to Hannah to finish us off for the day, sounds like ominous to finish the day. Um, I just wanna show the, the team behind, like the staff team and everybody in, in the, my team at CBI, we are in real time trying to capture what you're saying and we're doing that in different ways. And let me just show you another screen share here. Um, this is from your morning conversation about your aha moments. And so we try to do a pretty good real time summary so that we can make sure this is, this is clear, right? It's clear for everybody. Um, and, and it's gonna weave its way into uh, the next iterations of your work. Um, it's tough with 40 people to like consolidate that down and you're blessed with the great staff team that Hannah has and others. And so we're trying to capture these ideas and really weave it right into the next iterations. Okay, so that's our commitment from our end um, and from a staff side of this to really support you and making sure your big ideas are getting in there. Okay, that is that. And so with that, I'll just ask Hannah Last parting thoughts for us to finish up the day. Actually, I'm going to make Melanie say the first last parting thoughts. Excellent. Melanie. So that Hannah can actually wrap it up. Um, I would like to reiterate my thanks to everybody. It uh, was very educational to hear you articulate many of the ideas that were brought up in the working groups and to have those bubble back up here in a way that David and his team did an amazing job of facilitating. So thank you to all of you for doing that. Um, you know, I've got a great list in front of me of all the things that I heard you say as recommendations today. So I feel like there was a lot of progress made um, and that this was a great conversation to be able to witness and take advantage of. Um. Yeah, I, I, Melanie said it well. Um, Ken Coburn texted me a good parting uh, thought, which is a challenging one. And I, I, for those of you who um, have been sort of following the New York Times kind of stark uh, climate discussions, uh, there was a quote from last week that said, don't think of this as the hottest year in the last century. Think of it as the coolest year for the next hundred years. And I think that is uh, stark but um, probably a pretty motivating reminder of, of our work and how important this plan is and its boldness. And I think, uh, you know, we spent a lot of today kind of going back and forth between the need for boldness and, and how do we make it happen in an equitable way, uh, you know, and, you know, engaging the most low income people in our state in these solutions um, presents additional challenges, but it's really important to do. So, uh, just thanks for that reminder, Ken, and um, really focusing us. The one thing I, so I will just say in a very nitty gritty way, I've mentioned a couple times that we will be in touch with you in the next few weeks. Everyone had really thoughtful comments. You're all coming from different places. And, you know, we can't be together for the two day session at the Gus Civic Center that would really help us nail down every detail. So we're gonna be doing this via Zoom. And again, we didn't talk hardly at all today about adaptation and resilience, which is 
a huge and important part of the plan, but a plan that really needs, again, clarity and priorities. So um, we look forward to, to those of you who have a lot of expertise on that, really helping us dig in as we, as we write this in a way that, you know, Christina Ford and others remind us needs to be really understandable to the legislature, to, you know, to the main public who, who wants to see um, clarity, an action plan, and boldness from all of us. So, um, you know, we have a heavy staff lift, and I think we have a heavy lift as a council to bring it all together, but we're going to keep trying to do our best, and we highly encourage you to reach out to us about your kind of burning anxieties as we go into this last uh, month or so, because I think we really want to be responsive. We're not going to be able to come up, as David said, with a plan that everyone loves every aspect perfectly, but we want it to be a consensus document. So hearing from you in the next couple of weeks is, is definitely important. And we will try to stay engaged, but please feel free to, to engage us as well. That's all I got. Awesome, that's wonderful. Let's end on that. I'll say one parting word as well, which is if you did not take the survey for whatever reason, your power is out or um, other, other reasons, um, you actually can go in and do it and provide comment. Um, and also it could help shape if there's uh, topical areas that you really think we didn't cover and should be covered, lend your voice in that survey and then we can, that can help us uh, frame up our October 21st meeting. We'll see you all in two weeks. You're gonna have communication from us, both uh, some individual communication and others. There will likely be a webinar at some point um, on this uh, clean energy economy report. Um, and we'll weave that in to our discussions as well. Thanks everybody and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks for hanging in three hours on Zoom. Incredible, <laughs> we, we did it. All right, see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah.